day, one and all, and welcome to Microsoft Access 2016, Module 1. As you can see, my name is Dan McAllister, and I will be your instructor today. In Module 1, we're going to talk about the parts of a database, the objects that create it, um, how they relate to each other. But I think the first thing we should do is go grab some practice files. So I would recommend put your video on pause, go get the practice files that we'll need for today's class. They're going to arrive in a zipped version, and I'm going to drop mine out on the desktop and then we can talk about how to extract our files from the zip version. Never try to work on files inside a zipped folder. Always extract them first. So put your video on pause, go get our practice files, download the zipped folder, and when we come back we'll talk about how to extract them from the zipped folder. So put our video on pause, go get your practice files. All right, welcome back. Um, I'm going to now step out to my desktop where I have downloaded my practice files. And here they are in the zipped version. So I'm going to double click on them to open up the um, zipped version of this folder. You can see the file name extension here, .zip. And again, I was mentioning a moment ago, never try to work on files while they are zipped. So the next thing we need to do is extract all those files. So I'm going to click on this button right here to extract my files. And when I do that, you can see that because I placed mine on the desktop, the extracted version is going to be on my desktop as well. So that's what I'm going to recommend that you do with yours. Now depending on what browser you're using, when you downloaded yours, they may have gone into the downloads folder. I'm going to recommend that you maybe copy them out to the desktop, and then you can do what I'm about to do, which is extract these files. So again, it's about to extract a folder out onto my desktop, and I'm going to click on this button down here that says extract. I see a little progress bar go across there. And now out on my desktop, I'm actually going to have two copies of these files, one of them zipped and one of them extracted. Let me show you what that looks like here. So I'm going to close this window. Again, I'm going to head to my desktop. Maybe I can use my uh, Alt and Tab to get out to my desktop. And now out on my desktop, here is the zipped version, and here is the extracted version. I'm going to actually take the zipped version and chuck it in my recycle bin. If something becomes corrupted in the extracted version, then I'll still have the zip version, but I won't get myself mixed up by opening them from the wrong place. So put your video on pause, do what you just saw me do, extract those so that you can now see this extracted folder, and then I'm going to recommend that you uh, ditch the zipped folder, drop it in your recycle bin. All right, everybody, welcome back. So when you double click on your new folder, this is what I'm hoping you will see. Access modules 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8. We're going to, of course, go to access modules 1 and 2. These are the folders that you should see. So the first one that I'm interested in is named Northwind. Now, when you extract yours, you may or may not see the file name extensions out here. Don't worry about that. Turns out that's a Windows thing, not necessarily an access thing. And the file that I'd like to start with is uh, this one named northwind.accdb. So again, take, uh, take a moment, put our video on pause, extract those files, and then the last thing you want to do right here is open up northwind.accdb. I'm about to double click on that and open it up. Actually, I'm going to go a slightly different way. I'm going to start Microsoft Access first, and then I'm going to tell Access to open that file. So here's what Access looks like when I first start it up got a whole bunch of templates available out here. So these templates, the first place I can remember seeing templates pop up in a start screen in a Microsoft project was in Microsoft Publisher several years ago. Um, they would have all these cool templates with things like uh, greeting cards and calendars and cool stuff like that. Um, and then the next place that I saw templates on startup was on the Macintosh side of the Office suite. Now, every time you open up uh, one of the Microsoft Access, now, any time you open up one of the Microsoft Office programs, this is the first thing you'll see, whether you're in Word or Access or PowerPoint or any of your favorites, I guess except Outlook. Outlook doesn't really have templates. So as I scroll up and down here, I can see templates for things that would go on the web. Uh, by the way, to create a web database of some sort, you have to have a SharePoint server to upload it to, and I don't have that available today, so we will not be discussing the web apps. But the advantage of creating a web app is that your users could use it through their Internet Explorer. They wouldn't actually have to have a copy of Microsoft Access. 
So most of the uh, choices in here are pre-created databases. They don't have any data in them, but they would have a couple of tables and a query or two. And right now, any of you who are beginners, that won't really mean much to you, so I'm not going to start necessarily um, with one of those. What I would like to start with is one of those practice files that we just downloaded and extracted. So specifically, I'm going to go over here to my Open button, and then I'm going to navigate out to my desktop, because that's where I stored my files. Um, I can do that by browsing down here. And when I click on Browse, the first place it looks, like all good Microsoft and Adobe programs, is in the Documents folder, the Documents library in this case, specifically the My Documents folder. Except that's not where I extracted my files to. I put mine out on the desktop. So that's where I'm going to head. I'm going to go over here and click on Desktop. And now I can see my Access 2016 samples. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this Favorites area over at the left side, but it can be very handy. Um, for example, I'm sure that most all of us who work in some kind of corporation have times when we have to navigate to a shared drive. Maybe that S drive for the shared stuff, or that N drive for network, uh, a shared network folder. So sometimes you find yourself having to go to that N drive and then into a folder inside the N drive and then into a subfolder inside the folder on the N drive that lives in the house that Jack built. What I would like to do is make a little shortcut to my Access 2016 samples folder here. Now in this case it's not going to save me a lot. It's only going to save me one click. Next time I want to find it I don't want to have to go to the desktop and then go find the folder over here. So what I'm about to do is grab this Access 2016 Samples folder and drag it to the left. And I'm going to put it right here in my Favorites area. I have to be careful not to drop it inside another folder. That would just be recreating the problem of having to go to a folder and a subfolder. So I'm going to look for this little horizontal line between the folders as I drop it over here in my Favorites area. And the advantage to that is the next time I have to go to Access 2016 Samples, I won't have to go to the desktop first. It'll be sitting right here, and I can get to it with a single click. So I'm going to recommend that you take a moment and do that. You're going to go to File in Access and Open, and then go to your Access 2016 Samples, which was out on, in my case, out on the desktop. And then you saw what I did. I grabbed the folder and dragged it over here into the Favorites area. So why don't you put the video on pause, take just a moment and do that, and then we'll come back and we'll open a file named North Wind. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm headed to my Access 2016 samples folder right now. It's in the Mods 1 and 2 folder with a double click. And then let's open up this one right here, North Wind. Um, you may or may not see the file name extension .accdb. So just double click on North Wind. When it pops open, it should come up looking like this. And because it originally came from a website, it's got this security warning, just making sure that you trust where this came from. And if we do trust where it came from, hopefully we do, then we can click here on Enable Content. And then what you're going to see right now is the opening screen called the Splash Screen, giving you a chance to sign in as someone named Andrew Cincini. So why don't you put our video on pause, go open up that Northwind database, and when it opens up, you'll probably see the warning about certain content being disabled. You'll click the Enable Editing button, and your screen should look like mine. So put the video on pause, and then come on back, and we will do some stuff together. Welcome back, one and all. Congratulations on getting our first database opened and on screen. So when we left off, we were looking at this uh, login dialog window, it's called, offering us a chance to sign in as Andrew Cincini. I would like to turn down that offer to sign in as Andrew Cincini so that we can see the basics of the database before we try to start using it as any one particular user. So here's what I'm going to recommend right here in this dialog window. It's got its own close button. I'm going to recommend that we do that. Please click on that close button. And so now you can see... Um, that we have this database open, and we can see uh, the ribbon up here, and we'll talk about the parts of the ribbon for just a moment. And over here at the left side, we have something called, as you can see, the navigation pane. So um, at the top of the navigation pane, I see these little double chevrons, and when I hover over them, it says shutter bar, open and close button. So I'm going to click on that, um, the little double chevrons here. And when I do that, I can see a little bit more about my database named Northwind. 
Now, I know that I'll have a combination of veterans and beginners here looking at our first module. Let me talk to my veterans for just a moment. You veterans, you're used to seeing the tables in one list and the queries in another list and the reports in another list, and you're not seeing that right now. So for my veterans, in fact for everybody, let's go up here next to the word north wind and we'll click this little pull down arrow. It's called a list arrow. And when I click on it, I see several different ways that I can navigate through the objects of my database. First thing I'd like to do is change it from the name of the database, Northwind Traders, to group things by object type. By the way, um, I can't click on either of these gray choices here. They're not clickable choices. They're names. They're titles. So right here is the group called Navigate to Category, and I would like to navigate by the object type. So when I click on object type, now I can see the tables versus the queries versus the forms. By the way, the reason I'm seeing all of them is also here under the little list arrow. The top says navigate by object type. The bottom part here says I could show myself just the tables or just the queries or just the forms. The other choice down here is I have selected all database objects, all access objects. So I'd like you to put our video on pause and do that for just a moment. We had the splash screen that we closed so that we weren't signing in as Andrew Cincini. We had the expander double chevrons over here, and then we went to the pull-down list and selected navigate by object type. So take just a moment and do that to begin navigating by the object type, separating the tables from the queries from the forms. Put our video on pause, do that much, and then come on back, and again, we will do some stuff together. So now over at the left-hand side, I can see tables and queries and forms and reports. Well, that's great for my veterans to see things that way, but for my beginners, maybe you're wondering to yourself right now, okay, so what the heck is a table? What's a query? What's a form? Well, it just so happens I have a little diagram that I've created, and this is not the last time we're going to see this diagram. I'll be using it a lot through our lessons. So the most important part of your database are these guys right here, these tables. The tables are where all of your data is stored. Um, so you really can't have a database without some tables. Uh, next objects that we'll be talking about after the tables are these guys over here. The queries. Queries let you ask questions from your tables. By the way, um, I've got some arrows here talking about how data can be transferred between these different objects. So the data will be stored in the tables. When you run a query, it will pull certain records from the table and then display them on screen. But then if you begin typing information into the query, it will actually feed back into the table. That's what these two arrows are about. So when you run a query, it pulls information from the tables and displays it. And then while the query is open, if you begin doing data entry, you will be feeding the data back into the tables where they are actually contained. A little bit later, not necessarily right now, but in another module, we'll be talking about forms. Forms are a little bit more graphic way to pull information from tables and to actually do data entry into tables. So again, this is a two-headed arrow here. Data flows both ways, but it's actually stored in the tables in the end. Our fourth object, reports. Reports are much like forms. In fact, when we do the two modules about forms and reports, you'll see that they're very similar in their uh, design layouts. But reports are all about putting things on paper. And you also might notice that this is a single-headed arrow here. There's nothing you can put in a report that will feed back into a table. So reports pull information from tables and then do some special formatting to make your reports do things like add things up, running totals, grouping by customer, grouping by uh, product that you sell, and so forth. And you might also notice an arrow coming from a query. So if I wanted to remake a report about information from more than one table, Microsoft suggests first make a query that gathers the com columns, the fields that you want in your report, and then use the query as the record source for the report with the special formatting going on paper. So man, we got a lot of arrows here, but just in basic uh, things that I want you to notice here, queries can pull and pull push information to and from tables, and the same is true for forms, pull and push information to and from the tables. We will return to this this diagram more than once. This is not the last time you'll see this today. I'd like to introduce you to the names of the objects in the interface here. I'm going to start at the top of the screen. So it's a little bit muted up here. The colors are a little bit muted, 
But what I'm looking at at the very top here is called the Quick Access Toolbar. Now the fact that it has the word Access in it does not actually refer to this database program named Access. There's a Quick Access Toolbar in Word and Excel and PowerPoint. It's just the name that's set up for these buttons up here at the top. And again, they're a bit faded out in this particular session, but here is my Save button. Here is an Undo button. As I hover over them, they'll tell me their names. Here's an I Undid Too Many called the Redo button. And then I have a little pull-down list over here that I can add things to my Quick Access Toolbar. And we'll be doctoring up the Quick Access Toolbar a little bit later in our lesson. But notice checkboxes next to the things that are in there. And then another list of about 10 more things that Microsoft knows we might want to put in there. And new to 2013, carried over into 2016, the ability to add a button to go into touch mode. I'm going to go click on that for just a moment. I don't necessarily need you to do it, but I'd like you to see it. When I click on the touch mouse mode, it adds another button up here. And then if I click on it, I get a couple of choices. Do I want to turn it on for the mouse, or do I want to turn it on for a touch screen? When I click on touch, I'd like you to watch what happens to all these buttons back here. Touch. See how all the buttons got a bit bigger? Um, this is largely for people who work on tablet computers, handheld computers, with much smaller screens than I'm used to seeing on my desktop. So the ability to have the buttons a little bit bigger is going to make it easier for me to finger touch those things on a relatively small screen. In fact, I've got some friends who work in touch mode all the time, even though they don't even have a touch screen, because they like having the bigger buttons down here. I'm going to go turn that back off. I'm going to go click on that button. I'm going to switch back to mouse mode, which gives me a little bit more working area down here and makes all my buttons a little bit smaller. So that was called the Quick Access Toolbar. And again, the way I added that touch mode was I clicked on the little pull-down arrow over here. You notice as I hover over it, it says Customize My Quick Access Toolbar. And I slid down and I turned on the one for the touch mode. All that did was give me a new button, and then to actually turn it to touch mode, I had to click on the button and switch it from mouse to touch. So if you'd like to try that, feel free. Put our video on pause. Go add yourself a touch slash mouse mode button to your quick access toolbar, and then come on back. Now to continue with the names of things, right below my quick access toolbar, I see the words file, home, create. Those are called command tabs. And every time I click a command tab, I get a new set of buttons down in this area just below called the ribbon. So if I click on the Home tab, I get the Home ribbon. If I click on the External Data tab, I get the External Data ribbon. And one of these tabs is not like the others. One of these tabs is not the same. Come on, you Sesame Street fans. One of these tabs is not... Well, okay, maybe you're not Sesame Street fans. The one I'm talking about right here is the File tab. When I go over and click on the File tab, I got this whole new screen comes up. This is called the Backstage View. And Microsoft says the Backstage View is where you do things to your files rather than in your files. For example, to open a file or to save a file, to close a file, to compact it, to encrypt it with a password. So this is not ways to add new records to my database, but it is ways to do things with my database, like making copies of it and so forth. And anytime I want to step out of this backstage view, I just click the back button right here, and I'm back to my normal view. So again, if you'd like to try that for yourself, put our video on pause, click that file tab, take a peek at the backstage view, and then when you're ready, I click that back button, and you'll be back in your normal view with me. Take a moment and do that. So I have the command tabs that produce the different ribbons. The ribbons are broken down into groups of buttons. For example, under my Home tab, I have a group of buttons called the Views group, and then the Clipboard group, and then the Sort and Filter group. You can see the group names right down here towards the bottom. Uh, as I go to the Database Tools ribbon, that is when I click the Database Tools Command tab to produce the Database Tools ribbon, then I get the Tools group, the Macro group, the Relationships group. So just the names of things up towards the top of the screen. So we've got the title bar at the top. Right now it's slightly off screen. You can't see it. Right below that I have the command tabs, which each produce ribbons with groups of buttons. And then down towards the bottom of the screen, I have this area right now. It just says ready. That's called the status bar, and things will appear down there as we begin doing things. So that's kind of the names of all of the pieces. 
let's go look at one of our first objects here. We'll tackle... So that's kind of the names of all of the pieces of the interface. In a moment, we're going to open the first of the objects. That is, we'll open a table. It's time to explore the, in one way, the most important part of our database, and that is the tables. They are the most important because that's where all of our data is stored. So when I click on tables, it expands, in this case, to show me... Man, there's a bunch of tables in this database. Here's the beginning of my queries list down here. So in this particular database, we're keeping track of our sales. We've got customers, we've got employees, we've got inventory, we've got invoices. So let's take just a look at our customers here for a moment. I'm going to point at the table named customers and give it a quick double click. And when I do that, it opens up the customers table over here at the right hand side. Now in a lot of ways, this looks like Microsoft Excel. I have rows and columns of information. I can scroll left and right to see the, uh, the various columns. By the way, another name for columns to a database geek is called a field. So you'll notice I don't have a column A, a column B, a column C. I've got an ID column. I've got a company column. And to a database geek, that would be called the ID field and a company field. And what I would call a row in Microsoft Excel, we call a record in database geek terms. So I'm looking here at the customer's table. Notice it has a tab up here at the top, instead of the sheet tabs being down here at the bottom, which is where they would be in Excel. Um, so I can scroll left and right by using just arrow keys. I can also use my mouse to go down here to my scroll box in the scroll bar, drag it left and right. So in a lot of ways, this looks like Excel, but there are certain things that are different about this compared to Excel. For example, if I was in Excel and I hit the Enter key, it would jump down to the next row. Here I am in Access. Watch what happens when I hit the Enter key here. See how it jumps sideways instead of down? So that's just our first little example of ways that Access is different than Excel. And again, looking at the various parts of the interface that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, because we didn't have a table open until just now, I can see some things happening down here just above the status bar. The status bar says that this is the data sheet view, and then right above the status bar, I can see that I'm looking at records. And specifically, I'm looking at record number one of 29 total records. Now, in Excel, you've probably seen arrows like this to go to the next sheet or the previous sheet. In this case, it's not the next sheet, it's the next record. So right now, I have highlighted record number one of 29 records. When I click on the right arrow, you'll see now it's highlighting record number two. And record number three. I have to say, it's pretty rare that you're ever going to know, hey, I need to go to record number seven of this table. But just notice that as you move from record to record, it does show you that. Um, I do have a left arrow with a bar. When I click on that, notice it goes to the very first record. I have a right arrow with a bar. When I click on that, it goes to the very last record. And then just past that one, there's a little arrow, and it's a little bit hard to see. It's supposed to have a little flash on it called a gleam. And you'll notice as I hover over it, it says, new blank record. And when I click on that, sure enough, here I am creating record number 30 right now. Now, I'm not actually going to go through with that, but you can see there are some ways that this acts differently than Excel. So why don't you take just a moment, put the video on pause, and try some of the things you've seen me doing. Where I clicked, and then I used arrow keys to move from field to field, arrow keys to move up and down from record to record. I was also playing with the little navigation arrows down here. And if you want, go ahead and click on the button to create a new record. Just don't actually go through with creating a new record. So you're just going to take a moment and play with uh, navigating inside this table. So pause the video and get comfortable with that, and then we'll look at a couple other things. And I'd also like you to see one other thing about a table. Right now we're on what's referred to as the data sheet view of the table. But somebody had to decide what sort of things we were going to keep track of in our fields. The fact that we want to keep track of the company name, the uh, contact person's last name and first name and email address. That's done in something called the design view. And all the different objects we're going to look at here in the first couple of uh, sessions, um, they each have a user side where the data entry person does things. And there's also the design view. Sometimes I call it the architect side. Let me just show you a quick way to get into the design view. I'm going to go to the Home tab. And then under the Home tab in the Home ribbon, there's a nice button over here called the View button. 
And at first it kind of looks like some old uh, old style draftsman's tools over here. I'm using some third party software to zoom in on it like this. You won't be able to do that. You won't be able to zoom in like I just did. So I've got the pencil and the triangle and a little ruler here. When I click on that particular button, it takes me to what's called the design view of my table. And so in here, I have two parts to it. I have a top part, which has the field names, and then I have a bottom part that has the properties to the fields, and we'll be playing with these in a few minutes. But one of the things I'd like you to notice is, in my design view for the customer's table, I have a field named the ID, the company, the last name, the first name, the email address. We saw those just a moment ago, only instead of going um, up and down on my screen, they were going sideways. Well, if I go back to that View button, and I click on it, here I am back in my data sheet view where the field names go sideways across there. So why don't you put our video on pause for just a moment, and go up there, click on the Home tab, and click on the button to go to the Design view, please. Try that out, everybody, and then uh, come on back and we'll talk about it a little more. So here in the design view, I have several columns here. I've got the field name column, and then you can see for each field name, there's also a data type. Now most of them say short text, but as I use my arrow keys to move up and down through the various fields here, again, most of them are short text. One of them says long text, as you can imagine that uh, has to do with how many characters you can type in there. Uh, I also see uh, a hyperlink field down here. Um, in fact, here's one for attachments. If I click on the little list arrow right here, here's a whole bunch of different data types that I can have in my tables. And we'll be talking about these more as we go. And then there's a third column here. It says description. As you can see, it says that's optional. That's a place to write a little note to your data entry people to let them know, hey, this is what I expect you to be typing in this field. So again, we'll be doing um, some exploring of that in a few minutes when we start working with data. Right now we're just introducing the objects, and mostly what I want you to walk away with in our introduction to the objects is that there's the user side and there's the design side. So this was the design view of my table. I'm going to go up and click on this button to go back to my data sheet view. So if you haven't already, take just a moment to do that. Go to the design view, scroll up and down to see all the different field names in the design view. Try not to actually change anything in there. And then click on this button. Each time you click on it, it just takes you back and forth between the design view and the data sheet view. When you're done, come on back here and we'll be looking at the data sheet view of our table. Now over here at the left hand side in my navigation pane, I do have other tables that are available. Uh, if I click just once on a table, it's selected, but it doesn't open it. If I double click on it, it does actually open that table. And I've got another one down here for my invoices. So I've got tables about my customers, I've got tables about my employees, I've got tables about who ordered what on which days, and those are all stored in various tables. Now maybe I don't want to have all three of them open at the same time. I can right click on one tab here. I'm going to say close that sheet. I'm going to go to this one and right click and say close that one. In Excel that would be called a worksheet here in uh, Access. It's called a table. And I've got another choice here that says close all. Hmm, sounds kind of dangerous. But I'm going to be brave and click on it. Notice it didn't close the whole database. I still have all of my navigation pane objects available over here. It just closed all of the tabs that were open. Let's do a little bit of data entry here for a moment. I'm going to open up my customers table with a double click. And this Anna Bidex, let's say she would like to be known as Annabelle from now on. So I'm going to do my first editing here. I'm clicking right at the end of Anna, and I'm adding the bell. Nice southern name. And a pencil appears. And that pencil means that I am editing that record, and it also means that that record hasn't been saved. Now you Excel people, you're thinking to yourself, of course it hasn't been saved. Um, you would have to go to the file menu and choose save. Well, that's true for Excel, but it is not true for Access. In Access, as soon as you finish editing a record and tell it somehow that you finished editing that record, it updates the record right away. No special saving required. And one of the big reasons for that is Microsoft Access, unlike Excel, Access is built to be a multi-user program. In Excel, if one person has a file open and another person tries to open it, they will get a read-only copy. In Access, that's not true. So as soon as I change a record and tell it I'm finished editing it, it will save it right away, and the other people who might be working in that table, 
It'll take it a couple of seconds, but they'll be able to see the new data. So how do I go about saving a record? Well, a couple of things here. I could either hit the down arrow key to move to another record, or I can grab my mouse and click on the little pencil here. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go click on that little pencil, and that has saved that record. And if I close and reopen that table, you'll be able to see that it is no longer Anna. It will remember that we've changed it to Annabelle. So I'm doing that right now. I'm right-clicking to close just that table. I'm going to double-click to reopen that customer's table, and there is our new lovely lady, Annabelle Bidex. Why don't you take just a moment and catch up with me there? So I had had two or three other tables open simply by double-clicking. I did a close. I did a close all. And then I went in here and I changed Anna to Annabelle. And remember, once you finish doing that, as long as that pencil is there, it's not been saved yet. You go click on the pencil and it'll finish saving that record. So take a moment and do that, everybody. Do just a little bit of data entry into that table, please. Over here at the left, I have my group of tables is open. If I grab this scroll box in the scroll bar and drag down, I can find the end of the tables list and the beginning of the queries list. Now, I can have both of those lists open at the same time, but I'll spend a lot of time scrolling. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to collapse the list of tables by clicking this double up chevron right here. Notice that collapses the list of tables, and now if I click on the word queries, it expands the list of queries. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, I was looking at my customer's table. I seem to have a customer's query. It has the name Customers Extended. I'm going to double-click on that to open it. Tap, tap. So at first it looks like a table. It's got rows and columns. But if you look closely at the index tabs up here, you'll see there's a subtle difference between the icon for a table versus the icon for a query. The icon for a query is supposed to kind of look like two tables overlapping each other there. You'll get used to that. You'll be able to tell the tables from the queries with just a little bit of practice. So every time I run a query, it pulls information from my table. For example, I'm looking at my Annabelle Bidex down here. Having changed it in the table, now when I run the query, it changes it here in the query as well. But I'm noticing I have a column over here for last name and a column for the first name. Well, let's say Annabelle, she's really finicky. Now she would like to be known just as Annie. Now you'll notice I am not in the table right now. I'm in the query. I'm going to go over here and click on Annabelle's name. I'm going to use my backspace key. As soon as I start doing that, that pencil appears. Everybody remembers what that means. It means you're editing the record and it has not been saved yet. So I'm going to change that to just Annie. And then another way that I can uh, uh, finish editing the record is to jump to the next record. Now, if I was in Excel, hitting the Enter key would jump down to the next row. Notice here in Access, when I hit the Enter key, it stays in that same row. Um, so there's a couple of things that I might want to talk about there. You've seen that if I click on the pencil, it will finish saving that record. Let me just also mention, if I click on some other record here, notice the pencil disappeared, and Annie is now Annie. She used to be Anne, she used to be Annabelle, now she is Annie in this query. Boy, I sure hope that means that she's Annie in the original table. Well, let's go see. Here's my customer's table. Sure enough, here's my new Annie Bidex. And that's because of this, this diagram I had up here earlier. So I had Annie in a table. And when I ran a query, it pulled information from that table and found that she's Annabelle. And then in the query, we entered data, and it fed that through this arrow back into the original table that the query was built from. So those are interactive. Just remember where all the data is actually stored, however, is in the tables, not in the queries. On the other hand, if I go back to my Access database here, so here I have a table, here I have a query, they're being really interactive here, and I did say that all of these objects have a design side to them, so I'm over here working in the query now, I've just clicked on it, and now I'm going to go to the design view of that query. So this looks a little bit mysterious because we've never seen one of these before. But down here I have information about what I want in the query and how I want it sorted. So we'll come back, we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. But right now here is all of the fields that are in the customer's table from which this query is built. And then here are the fields that I want to see in there. And if I want to go back to the uh, data sheet side of that, I just go back up here to my view button again and click on it. And now I'm back into the data sheet view of that query.
So a query pulls information from tables, and if you then edit information in the query, you are actually storing that new information in the table or multiple tables from which the query was built. We haven't seen a multi-table query yet. That is coming up down the road somewhere along the way. Now there's one other piece of information I'd like to uh, talk about with data entry, and this is true whether I'm working in the table or in the query. Um, I'm going to go to the table. I'm literally flipping a coin here. So I'm going back to that customer's table. And I want to talk about the idea of making a mistake while you're doing your data entry. So let's say I'm here working on Miss Annie. Man, I'm changing her name all over the place. Maybe I'll change her phone number this time. So I'm going to scroll over to the right. We have some fake data here. Looks like everybody's got the same phone number. That's a little surprising. Um, so let's change the uh, phone number for Annie Bedex. So I'm going to change this to 0101 at the end of this. And sure enough, there's my pencil. All right, now let's, uh, let's say that I have, maybe I've hit the enter key thinking that that's going to save my file. Um, notice it did not. Pencil is still there. And now I'm starting to put in a, a home phone and I realize, oh, wait a minute, that's not actually her phone number. It's not 0101, it's 0102. Now I haven't saved it yet. So I can go back there and change it right now, 0102. And then I, you know, click somewhere else. As long as I haven't gone to another record, it hasn't been saved. So as long as I'm still typing, the pencil's still there, nothing has actually been saved. And I can make changes right then. Let's see what happens if I tap the Escape key. I'm going to do that right now, tapping the Escape key. Can you see what that did? It took away the pencil. And it put this record back to what it had been before I started typing there at all. So that's a little moral to the story there. If you are entering a record and you haven't left that record, it hasn't been saved yet, you can tap the escape key to put the record back the way it was. For example, maybe I couldn't remember what the original phone number had been, and I'm partway into the data entry and I realize I'm editing the wrong record. I can always tap the escape key to back out and, you know, just remove things that I've been typing as long as they haven't been saved yet. But what if they have been saved? Let's see. So if I click here and I make that a 0101 again, and then I click on the pencil. All right, I'm trying to hit the escape key right now. Tap. Tapping on the escape key. Too late to get me out of that to go back and fix that 0101. But I do have an undo available. So I'm going to go up to my quick access toolbar, and here's the undo button. When I click on that, there's Annie Bedex. And if I scroll to the right, there is her, her old phone number is back in there. Now, let's see how many undos I actually get here. So I'm going to change Annie's number to 0101. And then um, uh, Antonio Gratico, sure, boy, I'm having trouble pronouncing that one. I'm going to change that number as well. Now, notice as I click on the next row, the first one's pencil has disappeared. And now this one's going to be 0102. All right, so I'm going to tap my pencil over here. There, I've just edited that second record. Now, it's too late to hit escape. If I move down to the next record, and I start making this as 0103, as long as I haven't saved it, I can tap the escape key, and it will put that one back the way I found it. Now, I'm wondering about escape again. Could I get back, uh, you know, 0101 up here? I'm tapping the escape key right now. Too late for that. Now I'm going up here to try to undo. Too late for that. I get one undo. In other words, if I go up here and I change this record to 04, and then I move to another record or I click on the pencil, it's too late for me to hit escape, but I can undo that one. But I only get one undo. If I have saved two records, I can undo the previous one, but not the one I did before that. So let me wrap a little bow around that. Um, while you're typing, before you've saved it, you can tap the escape key and put it the way it was before you started typing anything. Once you have saved it, you get one undo. You can undo that last record that you edited. But if you've made a mistake on some record that was two records ago, there's no undo, there's no escape to get that back. There's a little shiver going up my spine right now. Because this is a big difference between Access and Excel. In Excel, I can make all kinds of mistakes, and when I go to close that uh, sheet, it'll say, hey, do you want to save the changes? And if I realize I made a bunch of mistakes, I can say, heck no, I don't want to save that, I made mistakes. But it is too late to do that in Microsoft Access. So data entry people, 
A little shiver ought to be going up your spine right now because you only get that one undo. Now, I've just been tooling right along doing stuff, and I haven't given you a chance to practice these things. So now would be a good time to put our video on pause. Come on in here into our query named Customers Extended. Try changing a couple of records. For example, here we have Elizabeth Anderson near the top of the screen right now. I'm going to scroll up towards the top. So feel free to change a name in here in the query. Uh, make sure you click on the pencil or some other way to tell it that you've finished editing that. And then go back here to the customer's table and see that it has, in fact, been changed in there. And then maybe change something in the customer table. Make sure you click on the pencil to finish saving that one. And then come on back here to the query. You should be able to see the information in there as well. So put our video on pause, take just a moment, and uh, try that out. Do data entry in the query, see it happen in the table. Do data entry in the table and uh, see it happen in the query. And then we're going to switch gears and start talking about forms. So take just a moment, pause our video, um, try those things, and then come on back and we'll talk about forms. In our last session, we were comparing queries to tables. Now I'd like to go one step further. I'd like to start talking about forms. Remember our uh, diagram here. So I'm going to right click and close all. And I want to talk about forms. So I'm going to hide the queries now. I'm going to click the double up chevrons to hide the queries. And I'll expose the forms list. So we were working with the uh, customer table and the customer query. Maybe we'll look at a customer form. Now there's a couple of them here. One of them says customer details. One of them says customer list. I'm going to start out with the one called customer list with a double click. Man, it sure looks like a table. It sure looks like a query. I've got the company names. I've got the uh, first name and last name of my people. Here's my Annie Bedex. So this is called a form. Notice it's got a little different icon than the queries or the icons had. And if I go to my little diagram here, forms can pull information from tables. And if you do data entry into your form, it will feed back into the table that it came from. So let me demonstrate that for just a moment here. So here's my form. Let's see, this Anna Bedeck, she's been, uh, she's been moved around and chopped up and given a new phone number and all kinds of new stuff there. About I'll look at Antonio Garatacos. And we're going to change his title over here. Now, he's an owner. Let's call him an owner manager. So I'm going to change that. Owner slash manager. Now you notice I'm typing this right into the form. A pencil has appeared. I'm going to click on the pencil to finish saving that information about Antonio. By the way, as I scroll left, he is employee number two. So if I go back to my list of customers in the tables, ooh, the table's way up here. So I'm going to expose the tables. I'm going to go to my customers list, double-clicking. So here's Antonio, the new owner slash manager. This is in the table. Remember, the tables store all the data. Remember that we can do data entry in either the queries, because they can feed back into a table, or in this case, the forms, because they can feed back into the table. And that's what we're doing right now, feeding back into a table. So I changed that in the uh, customer's list form, and it now has changed it in the uh, customer's table. Now there was another form over here called customer details. Let's look at that one for just a moment. So back into my list of forms here. And I'm doing my customer details this time. Notice this time, I see one record at a time. Now this can be handy if you've got lots and lots of fields in that record, so that instead of having to scroll left and right and left and right, you know, back in this table or uh, some kind of a linear query or a uh, table-like form that we saw just a moment ago, this details form shows me one record at a time, and I can navigate from field to field to field and maybe fit all the fields on one screen this way. Also notice I could conceivably have a picture of this person, she is, uh, she is not really faceless there. That's just a placeholder for it. But what I'd like you to see is there are two kinds of forms here. One of them looks like a table, and that one's great for looking up information, like all the people who live in New York, and you could see them all at once. Um, I can do those kind of uh, searches here, search for 
what state or province they're from, but then I would see all the people from Oregon one at a time. And I could navigate from record to record to record, as I have been doing with these other objects, navigating from record to record using the little arrows down here. Here I am uh, clicking on the arrow to go to record number two and record number three. So I can still navigate from record to record as I could with the tables, as I could with the queries. Uh, it's just this kind of detail form. I'm only seeing one record at a time. So this kind of a form is usually used for data entry, but not usually for looking up a whole bunch of people because you can only see them one at a time. The other form we were looking at that looked like a table, that one is more often used for the lookups where you can see all the people from Oregon or California or whatever you're looking for. But for data entry, you'd have to scroll left and right. That was this form. Okay, so we got forms, we got queries, we got tables, and you'll get used to seeing the different icons up here. So I just switched from a customer's table to a customer's form, and this was the uh, multi-record form version of it. But again, I can do data entry here. I'm not going to necessarily do it, but if I type here and I begin typing, you can see that pencil appearing. I'm just going to tap the escape key and step out of there. So that's the idea of a form. And as with the other objects, the form has a design view as well. So if I go up here to my form, uh, my uh, pull-down list arrow under the uh, view button, I can go to the uh, design view of a form. And here's what that looks like. So again, we'll be navigating back and forth between the design view and form view, the design view and the query view, the design view and the data sheet view, and so forth. Just again, each of these objects has the user side and the architect side. And again, I'd like to leave you just a little bit of time to practice. So why don't you work on record number two, whether you want to be in the customer list form or in the customer details form. Either way is fine. Go to record number two and change Antonio from an owner to an owner slash manager. Uh, make sure you finish saving that and then go check it out in the customer table to make sure that uh, changing it in the form has changed it in the table. And then if you'd like to try it in the other direction, change something in the table and then go look it up in the form. So just practicing for a moment to see how the table and the forms work together for data entry. One more type of object that I'd like to look at is called reports. So let me bring up my little diagram here again. Uh, so the tables are the most important. None of these other things really exist without the tables. And notice a single-headed arrow in this case. Reports can pull information from tables, but there's nothing you can put in a report that will feed back into a table. On the other hand, reports are all about fitting things on pieces of paper. So uh, there are some things that you can set up, like the margins, and uh, what do you want in the header of your report, what do you want in the footer of a report. You can print tables, you can print queries, but for example, if you tell it to print a query in landscape orientation, the next time you go back and try to print that query, it won't remember that you wanted it to be in landscape orientation. So if you want it to remember details about the printouts, you need to do that in a report. And that's what we're going to start talking about right now. So I'm going to head back to Access. I'm going to use my Close All to close this table and form that I was working in in the last part. Do a Close All here. Let's see, I'm looking at a long list of forms. I'm going to collapse that. I'm also looking at a relatively long list of tables, so I'm going to collapse that. And let's talk about reports, giving that one a double click. Actually, just a single click will open it. And I'm going to look at my customer address book here. So I'm going to double click on that. Here it comes. Notice kind of fancy schmancy stuff going on here. A little Rolodex look to it where I've got things alphabetized, all my people, my customers whose last name starts with an A, starts with a B, and so forth. So there's some extra formatting going on here that's not really available in the forms, in the queries, in the tables, and so forth. So why don't you do what you just saw me do? Put our video on pause, close any other objects that you have open, any tables and queries and so forth, and then uh, go to the list of reports and open up the customer address book report so that you're looking at the same thing I'm looking at right now. Pause our video, go open up that uh, report, and then we'll come on back. Okay, so as I scroll left and right, I can see information on here. Scrolling up and down, just rolling my scroll wheel. So there's my list of customers in an address book report. 
And it also has a design view. If I slip over here to my view button, this time I'm going to click on the little pull down arrow for the view button. I can see there's a report view, there's a print preview, a layout view, and a design view. We've said all of these objects have design views. So let's just take a peek at that one for a second, clicking on the design view. So here I've got something that appears at the very top of the report called the report header. Uh, down here towards the bottom is something called a page footer. And then if I scroll down some more, there's a report footer section. It's kind of hard to tell, but this is the part that does the little, uh, the red A or the red B that's appearing there. Page header appears at the top of each page. And the detail section is the layout for each of the records. So again, there's the user side and there's the design side, and those things are found under the view button here. So I'm going to switch back to the original one that I was looking at called the report view. Now in the report view, I'm scrolling down towards the bottom of this thing, and it's kind of hard to tell how much fits on a page here. This is kind of like a web page view, or it's sort of like a roll of paper towel with a bunch of printing on it. It's hard to tell how much is going to fit on one page. So I'm going to go click the pull down arrow to look at print preview this time. So it says there's a section that's wider than the page width and no other items in that space, so some pages may be blank. We'll deal with that as it comes. Let's click OK. And so here I am in the, um, the print preview. And now as I click on the little arrows here. It's not about go to the next record. It's about go to the next page. Here I've just clicked to go to page two. It says, oh, I got a blank page there. It was promising that a moment ago. I'm going to go to page three. Oh, there's information there. And then I'm going to go to page four. That one seems to be blank. The problem here is that the information is wider than the paper is. So I might need to do things like switch it to landscape orientation. It looks like it is already. And then it turns out there's a couple other things we can do to try to squeeze information onto a page. And we'll deal with those things later. Basically what I wanted you to see is there's a difference between something called the report view, which is just a big list, versus the print preview that shows you exactly how much will fit on each page. And I'm going to close the print preview. Here's the button to do that. So why don't you put our video on pause for just a moment, head over to your home tab, and switch views. So far you'll be in the report view. If you want to try the layout view, so far, you know, that's a little bit tough sometimes to figure out what's going on in there. Let's take a look at the print preview. This is the one where you can actually see how much will fit on each page. And this is also the one where you have a blank page on every other sheet. And later on, we'll talk about why. It's a little bit too early right now. It's just the introduction part of our reports right now. So again, switch back and forth between the design view and the report view and the print preview, if you will. And then when you're done, you can do what I'm about to do here. Close the print preview. And, you'll, and then maybe actually go to your uh, report view when you're all done with that. So take a moment and catch up with me check out the other views of our report. We won't be doing any data entry in there because you can't really do data entry in a report and feed it back into a uh, table. Since the end of our last discussion, I have closed the reports list. It was open like this, and I just clicked on the double up pointing chevron to hide all of the reports. And now I'd like to expose the names of the tables, so I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to scroll down and find a particular table named products. Now, single clicking on it makes it change color, but I don't actually get to see it. You have to either double click on it, or here's a way I haven't mentioned before. You can right click on it and tell it you want to open it. By the way, notice you could go directly to the design view when you right click. I'm just going to say to open that products table. So whether you'd like to double click on it to open it, or whether you'd like to do as I just did, right click on it, and then left click to open it, please open the products table. And then come on back, we're going to talk about some of the tools that you need for um, whatever kind of database you keep track of. All right, everybody. So hopefully by now you have that uh, products table open. And again, we're keeping track of products right now. There are other kinds of specialized database programs out there. For example, maybe you have used a program named ACT, A-C-T. That's a database program that handles your business contacts. Maybe you have used QuickBooks. That's a database program that keeps track of financial information. Well, Access can do that kind of stuff. It can do um, keeping track of your customers, can keep track of your products, 
keep track of your financial information. But no matter what kind of information you're keeping track of in your database, there are certain skills that you need, and we're going to talk about a couple of those right now. The first one has to do with sorting. So by default, this table right here, the products table, is being sorted by this ID column, the ID field. And that's because the ID field is something called the primary key in this table. And in a few minutes when we start setting up tables from scratch, we'll talk about what the heck is a primary key and why do you need one and what's it used for and blah, blah, blah. So right now this thing is being sorted by the ID column. Now as I scroll to the right, looking at my products, I can see there's a field over here called category. And I've got several products that are in the condiments category, several products that are in the uh, baked goods and mixes category. Maybe I'd like to put all of my beverages right next to each other, all of my condiments right next to each other. That can be done by sorting. So that's what we're going to talk about first, how to sort. So I'm going to tell it to sort by the category column by clicking anywhere in the category column. And then up here under my home tab, I see one button for ascending and one button for descending. And that's all about sorting. This is in the sort and filter group you can see right here. So I'm going to tell it to sort ascending by that category field. So now as I scroll up a bit, here's my baked goods are all right next to each other, then my beverages, then my candy, then my canned fruits. So you can see that it has created groups. Now maybe within the groups I would like to sort a different way. Maybe within the baked goods I would like to see the most expensive baked goods come before the less expensive baked goods, but I still want them sorted by baked goods versus beverages. Well, here is a common mistake that I'll see people make. So watch me, but don't do it with me. Uh, maybe what you could do is take just a moment and do the sort that I have done already. Click anywhere in the category column and then sort ascending. Put our video on pause, take just a moment to do that, and then come on back. All right, welcome back. You should have uh, everything nicely sorted by category. Now, don't do this next one. This would be a mistake. I'm going to scroll over here and I'm going to say within the category, I would like to subsort by the standard cost. Okay, so over here at the right-hand side, I've got baked goods and mixes. I've got four of those, so maybe I'll just highlight those four records here so we can remember which ones we're talking about. And then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to say, all right, I would now like to subsort this by the standard cost. So I'm going to click anywhere in the standard cost column, and then I'm going to sort that one in, how about descending order? All right, well, now here is my most expensive product is at the top of the list. And as I scroll down, my less expensive products come up. Well, what about my beverages and stuff? I scroll over here to the right. Uh-oh, I don't have my beverages all next together. I don't have all my dried fruits and nuts together anymore. So that was a mistake, but it's a common mistake. So I wanted to tell you, hey, I'm making a mistake, and then do something that I've seen people do so often, that if you try to do it, you'll think to yourself, oh, no, I remember that was a mistake. Which begs the question, okay, how do I tell it that I want to keep the category part together as I do the subsorting by the price. Well, first of all, thank goodness for undo. Now, you may remember when you're doing data entry, you only get one undo. Um, here, let me move my view up just a little bit while I'm doing my recording. So here's my undo button. I'm going to click on that. And so once I've done that, I'm going to scroll over here, and I can see, all right, I've got all my baked goods next to each other again. So that's the position that you're in right now. All right, so let me show you the good way to sort by more than one field. In Excel, you would have something called sort by, then by. Here in Access, we don't really have an exact parallel for that, but we do have something called advanced sort. So I'd like you to watch me first, and then you're going to try it with me. So I'm going to click on advanced. You can see it's a list um, arrow here. And I'm going to say I want to do an advanced filter slash sort. So you're just going to watch it first. I'm clicking on Advanced Filter Sort. And now down here at the bottom, I can see that I'm sorting by category in ascending order. However, I need to readjust that. So I'm going to just uh, click right here. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. So towards the uh, top of this little grid down here, there's this light gray area. And if I can get my mouse right on that when I'm not zoomed in, I get this black arrow. When I've got the black arrow, I can click, and it'll highlight that, that category. And then on my keyboard, I'm going to tap the Delete key, and it gets rid of that. So why don't you take just a moment and do what you've seen me do there. I went up here. Um, it didn't really matter what column I was sitting in in that table. 
I went to uh, the Home tab. I went to Advanced. I clicked on Advanced Filter Sort. Got me into this window. And then I put my mouse right at the top of that first column, got my black arrow. Microsoft doesn't call it this. I call it the black arrow of death. And when I clicked, it lit up that column, and then I tapped the delete key. So please do that much. Go to this window through the advanced filter sort and delete that first column. All right, welcome back, everybody. So here's the next thing I want to do. I want to make this field list up here a little bit taller. I can do that by grabbing this corner and getting a funny-looking two-headed arrow and try to make this whole thing a bit taller once I can get that two-headed arrow. That can be a bit of a challenge here. So here I am, uh, I've got my products table, and here are a list of all the fields that are in that products table. And so here's the deal. I'm going to put in the two fields that I want to sort by, but in this program, it likes to sort left to right. So I want to be able to sort it by the category, and then within the category, I want to sort it by the uh, price. So first I'm going to bring in the category. I may have to scroll down a bit to find that field called category. There it is. And if I double click on it, it finds the first spot available in the query design grid down here and drops it right in there. So there's my first one, category. And then the second one I want to subsort by is going to be the uh, list price. So then I'm going to double click on list price. And then you'll notice the second row here says sort. When I click in there, I get a pull down list where I can sort ascending or descending. I'm going to sort my categories in ascending alphabetical, and then within the alphabetical list of categories, I want the list price to be sorted descending. In other words, the highest price in any category should come first, and then through the rest of the list of that category, have the price go down. So why don't you take a moment and join me here. Let's see, you're already in the advanced filter sort. You saw me scroll up and down to find the fields. I double-clicked on the field name category double-clicked on the field name list price, and then made category sort ascending, list price descending. Do that much with me, and then we'll have a little drum roll, and we'll see it in action. So catch up with me for a moment. All right, time to see this thing in action. So I'm going to go up here to my ribbon under the Home tab. We've just set up a filter to get here. Now we're going to toggle the filter. That is, we're going to turn it on. So I'm going to click on Toggle Filter. And I'd like you to do the same thing. Click on Toggle Filter. Do that right now. Okay, now let's go look at our results. So here are my baked goods all right next to each other. I'm going to select those four records just so we can see that those are the ones we're talking about. And then as I scroll to the left to look at my standard cost, among those four, here's the highest standard cost among the beverages, and then lower, lower, lower. And then I got a $34 one here, and that's because that's the beginning of a new category over here, the beverages. So now among the beverages, they are sorted in descending order by their standard cost. So check out yours. Try your screen. Make sure that you're getting the same results so that in our uh, design view of that filter, we had the uh, ca uh, category on the left and then the standard cost on the right. And that told it to first subsort by the category field, and then within the category field, subsort by the standard cost. So compare yours with mine. I hope things are going well. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you've checked yours out so far. Now, what if I decide that I want to put them back in their original order? Well, there's a couple of ways I could do that. I could scroll over here and click anywhere in the ID field and then tell it to sort by that. That's what they were originally sorted by. But as I'm looking up in the uh, ribbon up here, I do see a choice about remove the sort. And as I hover, it's kind of hard to see, but it says clear all sorts. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to click on remove sort, and I can see they've shifted around. And as I look more closely, I can discover that they are now sorted by that ID field, which was the original. So try that on your screen, everybody. Go up and click on the remove sort button, and then notice that they are now sorted by that ID field again. Catch up with me. Put the video on pause and remove that sort. The next tool that we're going to look at is finding things in our database, as in find the next match. Find the next, find the next one, highlight the next one, find the next one. So we're going to be using this button right up here. Uh, looks like a little magnifying glass. The find command. So for this first one, we're going to look for words anywhere in this table, whether it's in 
the supplier ID column or the product name column or just what by using the find command. So I've clicked just anywhere in the table, that is, it has basically selected the first record. I'm going to go up and click the find button. Opens up a little dialog window here. It says, what is it you want to find? Notice there is a find and replace command here. Although, if I want to look for certain records and replace them with something else, we'll see that there's a query to do that with later that actually will give us more control than this would. So let's say I want to find the word dried in here. So in the find what box, I'm going to type the word dried, D-R-I-E-D. And why don't you do that with me? So it doesn't really matter what record you're sitting in, just make sure you're in the products table with me. So open up the products table. And then um, under the Home tab, let's everybody click on the Find command. Opens up this Find and Replace dialog window right here. And I'd like you to type in the word Dried. So put the video on pause, catch up with me that far. All right, everybody, welcome back. So um, now I get to tell it, do I want it to only look in the current field? Well, the current field is the supplier ID. That's what it's got lit up. I hate to tell you, it's not going to find the word Dried there. So instead, I'm going to say, look in the current document. That is, look through all of the columns, look through all of the fields. Now, if I leave this one where it says whole field, then that would only find records where the only thing in the column has just the word dried. And I doubt that that's going to happen. So I'm going to click on the list arrow here. Do I want the word dried to have to be the first word in the field? Or is it okay if it's the second or third word in a field? I'm just going to say, if it's got dried in any part of the field, I want it to find those. And then in the third list box here, I can say, well, search up from where I am. There aren't any records up from where I am. Or search down from where I am, or search all of them. Just in case I'm down on the 25th record here, I could say, you know, I don't have to worry about, oh, is the one I want above here or below here? Just find all of them. So I'm going to go with that. So catch up with me. Um, so you've clicked on find, you've typed in dried, now join me in these other things. Current document, any part of the field, and all. Do that much and come on back. Take just a moment. Put the video on pause and do that. Alright, here we are. We're ready to see it in action. Little drum roll. And I'm going to click on find next. And it seems to have found the word dried pears over here in the product name. And I'm going to click Find Next again, and now it's found the word Dried in the Category field, Dried Fruits and Nuts. Find Next, there's another category, Dried Fruits and Nuts. Here's another product that has the word Dried in it. So that was this part down here where it says Current Document, don't just look in one particular uh, field. So go ahead and do that. Click on a couple of Find Nexts. Put the video on pause and do that much. All right, very good. Now, what if I just wanted to find all of the products by supplier J? So I'm going to cancel this one for the moment, and I'm going to scroll to the left, and I'm going to click anywhere in the supplier ID column. And then this time when I do my find, I'm going to tell it only look in the current column, don't just look everywhere. So I'm going to click my find button. It's ready to look for the word dried. I don't care about dried anymore. I want to find all of the products by, how about supplier... D. And in this case, I want it to just look in the uh, current field that I'm standing in here. That is, I'm in the uh, supplier ID column. And it can be any part of the field, and I want it to search up and down and all of the records all at the same time, and find next. So here's one by supplier D, number ID, product number one. And product number 34 is also by supplier ID. Here's the next one. Supplier ID is one of the suppliers for uh, product number 43. And again, that was any part of the field. As long as the word supplier D appeared, then it should find that record. Find next, find next, until it can't find any more of those supplier Ds. So, put the video on pause and try that with me. Make sure you have clicked in the supplier ID column first before you tell it look through, um, you know, current, current field. So that was going to be look through the current field, any part of the field, search up and down and all, and find next, find next, find next for supplier D. So catch up with me. Uh, again, make sure you're standing in the supplier ID column. So instead of current document, it should be current field, any part of the field, all, find next, find next, find next. You should be able to find several of them. 
put the video on pause and try that with me. So we just found, so we just finished finding all of the records by supplier D. So we've done a couple of different finds. We had a find where we searched through all of the fields, and then we just had a find where we searched through one of the fields. So I'm going to end this particular lesson, and when we come back, we're going to talk about filtering for records. And this means hide all the records that don't match criteria that I'm looking for. So this is going to be kind of a find on steroids, if you want to think of it that way. So that's all I have to say about find at the moment. Our next subject of discussion is called filtering. Um, rather than find the next one, find the next one, find the next one, I would like it to hide all the records that don't match a particular criteria that I'm looking for. And the way I'm going to do this is through the auto filtering arrows that are at the top of each column here in Microsoft Access. Again, any of you who work with Excel, you've probably seen auto filtering arrows before. They're basically going to work the same way here. But I would like to mention a common mistake. So as I look at the um, product code, there's an arrow right up here, and I can use that to look for particular product codes. When I go to supplier ID, I click on there. I've got the different supplier IDs to choose from. But then I'm noticing in the actual data itself, not the column header, when I click here for supplier ID, I see a little arrow there. And I want to make sure that we don't mix those up in our brain. So if I'm in one of the records here and I click the pull-down arrow, I am making an assignment. I'm doing data entry. So if I say supplier C, and I get rid of supplier D, and I choose OK, see the pencil? I'm actually editing that record. I am not seeing just the records by supplier C right now. I'm actually changing that data record. Thank goodness for uh, the escape key. Since I've not clicked on the pencil or anything, it hasn't actually been changed. I tap the escape key. It goes back to what it used to be. So there's a big difference between using the arrow in the column header versus any arrows that might actually be in the data rows. So let me show you the difference here. If I go up to supplier ID in the column header and I unselect all and I choose supplier D in there, when I click on OK, it hides all of the records that don't involve supplier D. That's way different from find the next, find the next, find the next. So join me there. Put the video on pause. And um, let us click in the column header that says Supplier IDs and go ahead and search for Supplier D there. And then click OK and you should get the same results that I get. All right, good work so far. Now let's bring back all of the Supplier IDs. So we're going to go up and click on the little filter. And we can do it a couple of ways. We can either say Select All or we can say Clear the Filter from the Supplier IDs. And when I click OK, there are all of my records again. So join me. Click on the pull down arrow at the top. You can either use um, select all or you can say remove filter. I did uh, select all. So if you want to try remove filter, clear filter, um, you can prove to yourself that those either of those would work to show you all of the records. So pause the video and remove the filter for the supplier ID, please. All right, good work so far. Now what if I want to filter for not one particular thing, but maybe a range of numbers? Like I would like to filter for all of the products that cost between $15 and $20. So this one's going to have a little bit of a twist on it. I'm going to go to the uh, auto filtering arrow at the top of the standard cost column. And then, yeah, I get a whole bunch of checkboxes here. And by eyeball, I could select and unselect the ones that match my criteria. But sometimes, man, there's a lot of things to choose from there. So rather than me checkmarking this and that, I would like to introduce this guy right here, number filters with an arrow next to it. When I hover over that, it tries to bring a list out to the right-hand side. But in this case, I'm so close to the right-hand side of the screen, it puts the list on the left. And you can see it brings up things that look like English. So equals a certain amount, or all those that don't equal a certain amount, or greater than some threshold, or less than some threshold, or between two thresholds, like 10 and 15. So I'm clicking on uh, number filters. First of all, I've clicked on the uh, pull-down arrow up here under uh, next to standard cost, and then I'm ignoring all the checkboxes, and instead I'm pointing at number filters to have these things pop up in English. These are called natural language filters, by the way, if you care. And I'm going to click on Between. Here comes a dialog window. And I'm going to say the smallest ones I want to see have the uh, $10 standard cost. And the largest ones I want to see have the uh, $20 standard cost. And when I click on OK, 
Instead of seeing all 45 records, I see only the 11 that fall between my threshold numbers. So, remember what I did here. I am no longer filtering by you know, supplier ID or anything like that. So I'm filtering by the standard cost, and instead of using a whole bunch of check marks, I went with number filters, did a between, set an upper boundary, or a lower boundary at 10 and an upper boundary at 20, clicked on OK, and now I'm looking at 11 records. Come join me there. Do a filter to filter for everything between 10 and 20 in the standard cost field, please. Put the video on pause, and then do that, and then come on back. All right, welcome back. Now let's filter by two things at once. So among these things that have their standard cost between $10 and $20, I only want to see those that are, how about beverages or sauces? So while I have the current filter going on that's got me down to 11 records, I'm now going to go to the category field and I only want beverages and sauces. So I'm going to unselect all, I only want the beverages, and the sauces, got to scroll down a little bit to find the sauces, and I OK that. Ooh, much shorter list this time. So everything on my list is either beverages or sauces, and among those, they have to be within my price range there that was between 10 and 20 under the standard cost, which means this might not be all of the beverages and sauces. This is only the beverages and sauces that fall in between those prices that I had. So what if I wanted to see all the beverages and sauces? Well, the answer is I can go here and either select all or clear the filter from standard cost. And when I do one of those things, I get a slightly longer list. It still doesn't give me all 45 products because I do still have that other filter going on that says it has to be beverages or sauces. So put the video on pause and catch up with me there. So we started out by doing the, uh, the standard cost between 10 and 20. Added to that that we only wanted to see beverages and sauces. And then decided, well, maybe I'd like to see all the beverages and sauces without worrying about the cost. So I went back here and removed the filter for the cost, but kept the one for beverages and sauces. And that wound up with eight records. So take a moment and catch up with me there by doing some multi-filtering, everybody. All right, welcome back. Hope you're having some geeky fun here for being able to uh, choose things by checkbox or choose things from a pull-down list or choose things through the natural language filters that look like English but actually do produce like upper and lower boundaries of things. All right, everybody, good work. Hope you're having some fun for geeks. Let's go ahead and close the products table. I'm right clicking, I'm choosing to close it. When it asks me, do I want to save the changes to the design, they're talking about, do I want to save it with the filtering that's going on? That is, the next time I open this table, do I want it filtered like this? I'm going to say, no thank you. So please join me in that. We'll close the products table and we'll say, don't save the changes to the design of this. All right, now I'd like to issue a little challenge to you. Um, I would like you to go into our customers table we can go open that together right now. So let's go open the customers table. And so as I go over here and look in the uh, state province field, I can see two letter abbreviations. And right now, for some reason in my brain, I'm thinking of a national public radio um, presentation that I was a big fan of. Click and clack, the car talk guys. They are not on the radio anymore, I'm sorry to say. But as part, of their, uh, as part of their broadcast, they used to always say, click and clack from Cambridge, Matt, as in Massachusetts. So here is my challenge to you. In the customer's table, I would like to see only the people from WA or MA or CA. Actually, the CA talk guys, they always had that little accent there. So that's what I want, that's what I want you to show me. All of the customers from CA or MA or WA. Put the video on pause, do that. When you come back, I will have my version of that and we can compare our results. So put the video on pause, go find the MA, CA, and WAS. All right, I am about to join you. So I'm going up here to the state province filtering arrow. I'm going to unselect all. I want CA and I want uh, MA. And I want wah. All right, my little drum roll here. 
I'm clicking OK or hitting the Enter key. I am down to seven records. I hope that that is true for you as well. Woo-woo! Or maybe just a single woo-woo. Anyway. All right, good work, everybody. And uh, let's show all of them again. You can either clear filter or select all. And I am back to my 29 different customers. Good work, everybody. Good work on filtering there. Years ago, I was doing some database work for a jewelry store, and I was doing it in Excel. And I got talking to one of my geek friends, and he said, oh, if you'd convert that over to Access, that thing you're trying to do would be easier. So I got myself a copy of Microsoft Access, and I didn't know how to bring stuff in from Excel into Access, so I retyped several things that I already had in Excel and put them in Access, and then figured, hey, I'm going to go get a total at the bottom of the column. And I discovered at the time, this was back in the 90s, um, Access couldn't get a total at the bottom of a table. So I started reading about how to do that, and it turned out I had to do it through something called a summary report. And I figured out how to do the summary report and said, hey, this is way too hard. I'm going to go back and do this in Excel and didn't touch Access for several years until I could hook up with a guy who could kind of explain the ins and outs of it to me. So the good news is nowadays, since the 2007 version, you can actually do aggregating kinds of totals. When I say aggregating, I'm thinking of things like sum or count or average or those kind of things. You can now do that in a table, and I'd like to show you how to do that for just a second here, in the products table. So as I scroll over to the right in my products table, I have a numeric field here, the standard costs. So what if I'd like to total up the standard costs of one of each of my total products here? Well, if I scroll down towards the bottom, I should probably scroll to the left here for a minute. I can see a row where I would add a new record. So right now I've got 46 records. Excuse me, actually, I've got 45 records that have stuff in them. And if I were to click in this next row down here, I would be entering a new 46th product. But I'd like to introduce you to this Greek letter sigma right up here. It says totals. And when I click on that, look, I get a new row down here. So this is actually below the um, new record row. And if I scroll up a little bit, you can see that the total row will still be available even when I'm up here doing other stuff in my, uh, in my table. So in my total row, I'm going to scroll to the right-hand side, and talking about this row right down here, where I'm going to total up my standard costs. And if I just click in that new totals row, ooh, look at that sneaky list arrow. I click on the list arrow, here are these different ways of aggregating. Sum, or average, or count, or a couple of statistic things here standard deviation, variance. I just want to be boring. I just want to sum it up. And there it is. There is the sum of my standard costs. So why don't you put the video on pause, open up your products table. And uh, again, the way I got that totals row to appear was clicked on this uh, totals button. That made the new totals row appear. And then I clicked in the totals row under the standard cost, and I chose to sum them up. So why don't you do the same thing there, please? Catch up with me totaling that up. All right, assuming that you have done that, now maybe under the list price column, tell it you'd like to find the average list price. Go ahead and do that, and then I'll catch up with you. All right, assuming you've got that done, I'm going to catch up with you. I'm clicking here. I don't want to sum this time. I want to average, and there's my average list price. Now, if I think that I'm going to maybe copy this uh, sum here over to that column, I am afraid I'm sorely disappointed. There is no little auto connect button. There is no little quick copy button. Uh, I would not be able to copy and paste. So that's one thing that can be a little bit irritating about the uh, totals row. You have to go to the bottom of each column and tell it what kind of aggregating you want to do for each column. But good work. We summed and then you guys did an average and I am so proud of you. Well done. We'll be using that more in different modules. So up until now, we've been working with a database that was presented to us. Our next subject of discussion, we're going to start talking about what if I need to create a database from scratch? Ooh, a little bit scary, a little bit daunting. So let's close out what we've been working on here. I'm going to close the customers table. Uh, when you close yours, it's probably going to ask you, do you want to save changes to the design of it? I would recommend that you say no. And then what I would like to do is start a brand new database.
but when you're designing a database from scratch, it is really not best practice to just start in Microsoft Access. What I always recommend is maybe start in Microsoft Word and then start thinking of what kind of information do I need to keep track of. So for our purposes, we're going to start building a small database for a veterinarian's office. So first thing I would recommend is we're going to go to Word and we're going to start like keeping track of, okay, what sort of information are we going to need for this? So I'm going to switch over here to Word. Crank up a copy of Microsoft Word here. And I'm just going to start a blank document. Hey, look, templates here in Word, just like we had templates in Microsoft Access. So I'm going to start with a blank document. So again, we're talking about things that we may, might need to keep track of for a veterinarian's office. So those of you who have animals, you're probably way ahead of me on this, thinking about what kind of information have you had to give to your veterinarian's office. So I'll start talking about a couple of things, and we'll start making a list, and then I'll put the video on pause, and I'll make the list longer so you don't have to watch me type stuff. Um, so in general, just kind of brainstorming. So as far as when I take my pet in there for the first time, I need to tell them my pet's name. So pet name. And maybe what else about my pet? The uh, type of pet that is like dog versus cat, etc. And then let's see, maybe the uh, the breed. Which kind of dog do I have? A uh, do I have a German Shepherd? Have I got a Angora cat, etc. Let's see, uh, somewhere in there we're going to have to have some information about the owner of the pet. So it might have the owner name. Might have a uh, date of first visit, something like that. What else do I need to know about the pet? Let's see, we got the pet, the type, the breed. Maybe why did they come in? What was the purpose of the visit? And let's see, more information about the owner, like where do they live? So we're going to have to have like the address, and city, and state, and phone number, and stuff like that. So maybe in your head right now you're thinking of uh, this kind of information that we need. So I'm going to pause my end of the video and add some to this list. And, uh, you know, you may have some more that you're thinking of, and, um, and we'll take it from there. So I'm going to put the video on pause and add some more to this list. So here is a partial list, and I've uh, changed the layout a little bit of it so that I can uh, talk about the fact that some of these things should go in a table about the pet, and some of these things should go in a table about the owner. And then later we'll have to figure out, so how do we gather information from both of those tables and get them into one kind of, some kind of printout. So let's see, the pet name should certainly go in the pet table. The owner name should go in the owner table. Let's see, phone number, probably in the owner table. Type of pet should probably go in the pet table. Date of birth, probably not really worried about the owner's date of birth. Now, um, a lot of times when I go into the, uh, into the veterinarian's office, they calculate the age of the pet. But we can always do that calculation if we know the date of the birth. Pet gender, and we might also need to deal with things like spayed and neutered and stuff like that. The breed, yeah, that's probably about the pet. Street address, city, state, zip code, those are probably all things I need in the owner table. Personally, I'm hoping this one about the weight uh, has to do with the pet and, and not mine as the owner. Uh, I'm hoping. And we may come up with more, but... That's our first idea, is uh, what should go in what table. Now, if I start talking about why did the pet come in on that day, uh, then maybe I need another table about each visit. And if there are certain things that there's always the same charge for every time we do it, like spaying and neutering and that kind of stuff, then maybe we could have a separate table of the different procedures and how much they cost. And then keeping track of what doctor did what kind of stuff, so I'd need a table about the doctors. So this can grow, you know, exponentially pretty quickly, but I just want to corral it down to like two tables here to start out with. 
So now that I've got some of these ideas, maybe now I will go over to Microsoft Access and start creating these two tables. So I'm going to keep this document around here. We will refer to it as we go. In the meantime, I'm going to go back and uh, crank up Access again. And um, we're going to start making a thing here from scratch. So come with me to the File tab, everybody. And we will click on New. And it opens up this list of different templates that are available. But notice the one just in the upper left corner here is Blank Desktop Database, and that's actually what we want. So again, come with me up to uh, the File tab to enter this area called the Backstage View. In the Backstage View, we're going to click on New. And among all these different templates, we're going to go with Blank Desktop Database. And mine is ready to create a database named Database 1. I think I'd probably eventually like to give it a better name than that. And uh, you may or may not see the file name extension here, the .accdb. That is, um, that's a Windows thing, not necessarily an Access thing. Also notice where it's ready to put this. In the Documents folder under My Name. I think I'd like to change the name from Database 1 to Veterinarian. So why don't you come do that much with me, just so far. We went to, in our Access uh, Database window, we went to File and New. In the background here, we clicked on Blank Database. That got this window open. So come join me that far. Put the video on pause and come to this spot. All right, everybody, I'm not quite ready to click the Create button because I don't want to put this database in the Documents folder. I'd like to put this database in the same folder as the databases that I downloaded from the website. So, I'm going to click the little uh, Browse Folder button here. Come do the same with me. And I made a little shortcut out here on the left-hand side so that I could get to my Access 2016 Samples folder. So I'm just going to click there. If you didn't do that with me, then you would need to go to your Desktop or your Downloads folder, wherever you downloaded your uh, practice files to. And um, let's see, this thing I'm about to create, it's really in our Module 1, so I'm going to put it in that folder, Access Modules 1 and 2 folder, and I'm going to name it Veterinarian, and let her rip. Click on OK. So join me there. Let's put our new Veterinarian database, even though it doesn't have anything in it yet, into that uh, Access Mods 1 and 2 folder of your uh, 2016 sample files. So I'm clicking OK, and so that tells it what to name it and where to put it. And then last but certainly not least, click on Create. Little spinner on screen, and now you can see it's about ready to create something called Table 1. And it's added a column called ID, and then it's got another column here that says Click to Add. And um, so even though we haven't had a chance to save this table, it's generically on the list as Table 1. So hopefully you have done that. Put the video on pause, click on your Create button, and your screen should look just like mine right now. Having created the structure for our database and given it a name, might be a little bit hard to see, but it's up here in the top, Veterinarian Database, um, we are now in the Datasheet view where we could actually begin trying to enter records, but we don't really have the structure for our table yet. Traditionally, that's done in the Design view. So under my Fields tab here, I'm going to go over and click on the Draftsman's Tools to switch to the Design view of this table. And the first thing it wants to do is name it. I'm going to call it uh, Pets. And then I'm going to hit the Enter key or click OK. And here I am now in the Design view of the Pets table. So join me there. Tell it you're going to create your first table and you're going to switch to the design view of that table, please. Put the video on pause and catch up with me. All right, welcome to the design view of our first table. Um, you can, should be able to see its name here, pets, and should be able to see the name of it over here as well. And then here is my first field, and it's got a funny little symbol over here. I see the words primary key, and then there's supposed to be a little miniaturized picture of a key over there. So when you create a table, it's not required that you have a primary key, but it is, shall we say, strongly suggested. So what the heck is a primary key? Well, it's a term that you'll hear in pretty much any database class you ever take, uh, and what it means is it's generally called a unique identifier. And that what that means is that no two records in that table 
can have the same value in that particular field. Now it wants to name this ID. And when I go to create a owner table later, it's also going to try to suggest a field named ID. And uh, that can be a bit confusing later on when I start trying to bring things in from more than one table. So I'm going to be a little more specific here. I'm going to change the name of this. I'm clicking right where it says ID, I'm hitting my left arrow key, and I would like to call it pet ID. And the next thing I'm noticing is there's a data type over here that says auto number. One of the nice things about an auto number data type is that you will never have the chance to accidentally have two records with the same value in this field because it's going to automatically number the next one each time you type stuff in this field. And then there's a third column here that says description. Notice it does say this is optional. This is where you write notes to your data entry operator telling them what's expected of them for each of the fields. And I try to always put in a description of some sort. So I'm going to say the description on this one is, don't try to type here. Just tap Enter key. So again, don't try to type here, just tap Enter key. Why don't you take a moment and put that in the description column. Put our video on pause, catch up with me there. All right, now down here towards the bottom of the screen, I have some properties for this field, and we're going to be talking about properties as we go. For this first one, we don't really need to mess around with them very much. So what I'd like to do next is get half my screen to look like this access window, and the other half of my screen to look like my Word window. And you don't have to worry about doing this. So I'm going to grab this thing and drag it over to this half of the screen. And then I'm going to bring up my Word window. And I'm going to drag it over to the left half of my screen. This is called snapping to the edges of the screen. So now um, I'm going to be able to help myself remember what was supposed to go in my pet table over here. Let's see, let me hide the property sheet for a moment. Okay, so we had the, uh, the pet name was supposed to be in our pet table. So I'm going to fill that in as the name of a field. I'm not putting in the pet name yet. I'm building the categories that we're going to keep track of. So pet name is one of my fields. I'm hitting the down arrow key. The type. And then we had maybe the breed would be good to have here. And then how about the gender? And maybe the date of birth? So you got the name, the type, date of birth, gender, got the breed, and the weight. Again, of the pet, not of me. And you might notice as I'm typing each of these things, they all think that they're going to be short text, and very often that's the case. Like the pet name, that's going to be um, a relatively short text. And so what does that mean? Well, let me open up my window a little bit more here. So short text means that the maximum number of characters I can type in that field is 255. Now I'm probably not going to have a pet name that's that long, although every once in a while I will stumble across on television They'll have, like, this year's dog show, the best-in-breed dog show. And they, the dogs have names like Thurthington on Smythe from Avon the Third, But even then, I don't think they're going to take up, like, 255 characters. Uh, one other thing to note is that it will set aside 255 characters of storage space, even if the pet name is only five characters long. And what that can mean is, as you get lots and lots of records in your database, you're wasting a lot of storage space storing, you know, this many characters where you're only going to use a few. So we'll talk about some of these other properties down here as we go. So for pet name, short text, yeah, that's probably appropriate. And then a little note to my data entry operator. You could say, what are they supposed to type in here? Well, type something like fluffy or spot. If I can't think of a way to describe what I want them to type, I'll give them little examples like this with the word fluffy. Okay, so now type. I'm hitting the down arrow key. And so type could be like dog, cat, or turtle, or zebra, or something like that. Let's see, the breed. So that could be like poodle, Siamese. See, for a turtle, I only know of two, the box and the snapping. So I'll go with the snapping. So again, these are just 
just suggestions to my data entry operator, telling them what sort of information I expect them to type in. So gender, let's see, I'm going to have this be a single character. So it could be like uh, M equals male, F equals female, N equals neutered, or S equals spade. Now, date of birth. Um, that one's fairly straightforward. And it turns out there are several different formats that we could have for date of birth. So I'm going to tell my data entry operator that what I'm expecting is mm slash dd slash yy. Now just typing that there doesn't force it to be that. There is some actual formatting that we'll have to do for that. And then the weight. So maybe I want the weight to be in decimal pounds rather than pounds and ounces. So I'm going to type that in, meaning like 4.3 pounds instead of trying to type in 4 pounds, 8 ounces or something like that, right? So I'm going to call it decimal pounds. And again, this is uh, information for my data entry operator, and, um, and we'll see how that shows up for, for them. All right, so take a moment and put your video on pause and come fill out what I have filled out, please. So I went to the design view of that pets table, and so far, you know, we still have to do some stuff here in the data type column, but fill out what you can see on my screen so far, please. So put the video on pause and catch up to me there. Um, there's one of them that you can't quite see off the bottom, and that was weight in uh, decimal pounds. So put that video on pause and catch up to me filling in that much, please. All right, everybody, now we're going to concentrate on the data type here. So pet name, short text is appropriate for that, but I probably don't need 255 characters. So I'm going to fill that one in as maybe, let's see, Thurthington on Smythe on Avon the third. Picking a number kind of out of the air, 25. I don't think I would ever use more than 25 characters for the pet name, and if I decide that eventually I do need more than that, I can always change it later. So short text initially was set to use up 255 characters. We probably only need 25, so let's change that. Pause the video and do that right now, please. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is go down to the uh, type of animal here. And this is going to be, again, like cat, dog, turtle. Let's see, giraffe is kind of long. Rhinoceros is a lot of letters. So I don't know, maybe 15 for this one. So that'll be my field size this time is going to be 15. Now you can see there's a lot of other uh, field properties down here, and we'll talk about them, you know, as they are appropriate along the way. I'm not going to talk about every single one by any means, but we'll talk about uh, several of them along the way. So the type field for the pet, you know, dog, cat, etc., 15 characters field size. Catch up with me there. Pause the video. Fill that in. All right, the breed. We could probably get away with, let's say, 15 there. The gender, if it's spelled out like this, I really only need one character there. So again, the breed was 15 characters, the gender, one character. All right, continuing on in our list here, the date of birth. Now, this could be text. But eventually, I'm going to want to be able to do math with it. Like, how many days, how many years old is this uh, animal? And you won't be able to do that with text. So I'm clicking, and I'm noticing the little list arrow here. I'm going to click on the list arrow, and you'll notice there is a choice that can store dates and times. So that's what I'm going to change that to. Instead of short text for the date of birth, it's going to be date and time. So do that one. Catch that one up with me. And then we got one left here. The weight. I said I wanted it in decimal pounds. So if I needed that spelled out in pounds and ounces, like X number of pounds and blah blah ounces, that would have to be text. But again, I may decide I want to do math with it, like how much heavier or lighter is my animal this time than last time. So I'm going to click and I'm going to use the list arrow. And we've got choices here, like one of them says number. One of them says currency, like when I need to keep track of the... Uh, you know, the balance due, that's probably going to be a pretty important thing in one of our tables somewhere along the way. 
Yes, no would simply be a checkbox that you can check in. Hyperlink could be you click on it to go to a website. Or you click on this field to open up a Word document that's the contract that our um, customers have to sign. Things like that. Um, you could attach a picture of the animal. Could calculate certain things. And these are, you know, several of these are things we'll talk about along the way. But I think right now for this one, I'd like it to be number. All right, so there is one more thing to talk about number here. Because I'm looking at the field size property, it says long integer. And so I'm digging up some dead brain cells now, trying to remember what the heck is an integer. Well, it turns out an integer is a whole number, like 2 or 3 or 4. If this is going to be an integer, it cannot be 2.5. And yet I said I wanted the pounds entered as decimal number, so I need to change something about that field size. I'm going to click right there where it says long integer. And as I do that, it tries to give me a little bit of help over here on the right-hand side. And I'm going to use some third-party software to zoom in on that. You won't be able to zoom in as you just saw me do. So it's trying to tell me about this, the size and the type of the numbers to enter into a field. Most common settings are double and long integer. And if this field is joined to an auto-numbered field in a relationship, coming up later, then it's got to be a long integer. But in my case, if I want to enter it in pounds and ounces, it can't be an integer of any sort. So I'm going to click the pull-down arrow, and I'm going to make it something called single precision. And you don't necessarily have to know what the difference is between single and double, um, but basically what I, the reason I'm using it is that it's not an integer and I can enter decimals in there. Um, there is actually a choice here for a decimal. Might as well click on that. All right, join me there. Make that weight a number and make it decimal. All right, everybody, so that's the definition of all of the fields in our first table and some instructions to our data entry people. What I'd like to do now is switch from the design view to the data sheet view by clicking on this little button right up here. And it will tell you, hey, you have created a structure here that you've got to save. You must first save the table. Do you want to? We're going to click yes. And then here is the place for our first record. So do that much. Go ahead and click on that data sheet view. Have it come out here. We're going to take a little little break at the end of this particular session. When we come back, we're going to start entering data into there. So put the video... Actually, you don't even have to put the video on pause. This is the end of this particular session right now. So having created our table in the previous session, we are now ready to try to do data entry into the table. Now, right now, my uh, cursor is flashing in the pet ID field. Even if it's not flashing there on yours, um, it turns out the pet ID field is the one that's active right now. And you may remember we wrote a little description for our data entry operator that said, don't try to type here, just tap the enter key. And I wish that that would appear in big red letters across my screen. It doesn't. It's way more subtle than that. It's happening way down here in this area called the status bar. There's my note to my data entry operator. Don't try to type here. Just tap the Enter key. So let's do that. Let's tap the Enter key. And now it's going over to the pet name field. And down here in the corner it says, all right, that would be like Fluffy or Spot. So let's see, our first pet, maybe this will be, uh, maybe this will be a cat named Fluffy. So Fluffy, as far as the name of the pet, the pet name. And then I can hit either the right arrow key or the tab key or the Enter key to move over to the next field. Remember, unlike Excel, where if I hit the Enter key, it would jump down to the next record and the pencil would disappear because it would have saved it. By the way, also notice what happened in the Pet ID field here. This is pet number one. Woo-woo, we are pet number one. Get out that big uh, pink foam finger. Pet number one is Fluffy. So that was automatically numbered. That was an auto-numbered data type. All right, Fluffy is a cat. More specifically, Fluffy is an Angora cat. Gender. Uh, Fluffy is a uh, female cat. Now, remember we set the um, length of data at one character. So if I try to type female, it's just generally beeping and laughing at me there. So I limited it to one character, therefore that's all I can type in there. Date of birth. Ooh, there's a little mini thing going on over here called a mini date picker. And when I click on that, it gives me a little calendar. 
And if Fluffy was born today, then I can click the Today button. Or I can click on any date here, or I could actually type a date. So I'm going to go, like, override the little date picker. I'm going to click in here and type the date. We'll say Fluffy the Cat was born on, oh, how about Valentine's Day of 2012. Ah, oh, Valentine's Day. Um, and then as far as the weight, I'm clicking in the weight column or hitting the right arrow or tab or enter key. And I'm noticing down here it says it's supposed to be typed in in decimal pounds. So we'll say uh, Fluffy the Cat right now, as of you know today's visit, is 6.3 pounds. And then I hit the tab key. And because that was the very last field in that record, it assumes that I'm ready to enter the next record. And the little pencil that used to be over here has disappeared, even though there was another column called Click to Add. By the way, if I click on Click to Add, it says, all right, what kind of field would you like to add here? A yes-no field, a date-time field, whatever. And then I could give it a name. So I can actually create fields right out here. And for the next table we create, we'll actually be doing it that way rather than the traditional way, which was to go to the uh, design view up here. So for the moment, I don't really want to add that new field. And I'm not really ready to add a new record either. So join me there. Fill in that information for Fluffy the Cat. And then we're going to go create another table here. So put the video on pause. Catch up with me so far. We'll see you in a minute. It is time to create our second table. When we first created the database, it handed us a table one. And we changed that name to pets and filled in information in the uh, design of it. And then now we've filled in uh, data in it. It's time to create our second table. And this time I'm not going to do it through the design view. So to create this second table, come with me to the Create tab up here. And then in the section about tables, if I were to click Table Design, that would take me to the Design window. If I clicked on SharePoint List, I would be creating a table that I could store on a SharePoint website. I do not have such a thing here. So instead, what we're going to click on is just this one that says Table, creating a blank table. So I'm clicking on that, and I would like you to do the same thing. Please click on the button that says Table. Pause the video and do that much. All right, welcome back. You can see the generic name here, Table 1. Let us right-click on that tab, and we'll save it. I know we don't have anything in it yet, but this will give us a chance to name it something better than Table 1, like Owners. Hitting the Enter key or clicking on OK. So now we have a new table named Owners. It doesn't have much in it yet, but there it is so far. So pause the video and do that much, please. So here it's got a generic name for my ID field. I would like this to say owner ID instead of just ID. So here's what I would recommend. Let us right click where it says ID, get a little pop-up menu about that field, and notice one of the choices down there is to rename that field, and to rename it I'm going to name it owner ID. And I'm not going to put any space in that. I'm going to make it one, one big long field name there, Owner ID. So please pause your video and do that with me. When I hit the Enter key, that becomes the new name of it, and then it moves over here to the Click to Add. So right-click on that first column, rename it Owner ID, and then maybe hit the Enter key or the Tab key, and it jumps sideways here. All right. Now, I could say that I'm going to enter a short text field and have it be the owner's name. But there is one thing that I should mention about people's names. Usually in a database we will separate them out into the first name field and the last name field. And we do that for a good reason. Um, one of them is the sorting. So if I were to just have a field named owner name and I filled it in like Bill Smith and Mary Brown, then later if I decide I want to sort that, I can only sort it by the first character in the field. I'd be sorting by the B in Bill or the M in Mary. So for years, we used to get around that by entering the names like this. Brown, comma, space, Bill. Smith, comma, space, Mary. And that worked for a lot of years until the form letter came along, where you're taking a list of names and then mixing them with a Word document, and it's supposed to look like it was written just for them. Won't that feel all warm and fuzzy when you get the form letter and it says, Dear Smith, comma, Mary, you may have won the $10 million and... So we're usually going to separate first name and last name, and I would like to do that here as well. Now I could do them one at a time. 
but starting with the 2013 version of Access, and definitely carried over into the 2016 version, there are some shortcuts that we can use for entering things like names and addresses and so forth, and I'd like to expose those to you now. So, watch my screen here. I'm going to go up here where it says More Fields. Click on that. I've actually got quite a list. Number field, long text, short text, currency, euro, um, just all kinds of things in here. But I'm going to scroll way down towards the bottom. There's a kind of a cool area down here called Quick Start. And so one of the quick starts I'd like to expose you to is this one called Name. So again, how did I get here? Well, um, I'm sitting with my cursor in that second field, having renamed this first one Owner ID. And then I went up here to under the Fields tab, clicked on Mo Fields, scrolling down till I can see Quick Start, and then watch what happens when I click on Name. Boink! Last name, first name. Fills it right in there for me. Of course, I'll have to do the data entry for myself. But, saved me a little bit of work with that quick step there. So please do that. That was More Fields. Scrolling down towards the end, quick start, click on name, and your screen should wind up looking like mine. Pause the video, catch up with me. All right, well done. Let's do another one of those quick starts in that next column over here. So click to put your cursor in that next column. You're going to go back there to more fields, and we're going to do a quick start for address. When I click on address... I get a street address, a city, a state or province, a zip code, postal code, a country field. Now, maybe I don't need all of those, but it sure is handy to have that quick start put in columns for all of those things. So your turn. Remember, you want to have the cursor in the text box right under the part that says click to add. And then that was more fields quick start for address. So pause the video and catch up with me there, please. All right, good work. Now I could continue adding more fields out here. Let me go to my field list that we had created earlier here. So we've got a section for the owner name. Got a section, I'll just mark these in red as I go. Street address, city, state, zip code. We've got placeholders for those. We don't seem to have one for a phone number. And I'd like to kind of do a special thing with the phone number field. And I'm going to switch to the... Uh, design view for that. Now a couple of things that we might want to just stay out here and do just to prove to ourselves that we can. You may remember that one of the uh, details, one of the properties of a field, at least if it was a text field, was how many characters we could put in there. And you don't actually have to go to the design view to do that. I see a box right here for the field size. So let's do a couple of those right out here. Let's click under the uh, last name column. And we'll set the field size there for, gosh, even if I have a, a woman with a hyphenated name, I'm probably not going to have more than, I don't know, 20, 25 characters. So that's what I'm going to make this one, 25, and I'm going to hit the Enter key. And then for a first name, I don't know, 15 maybe. Address, now this is just the street address, not including the city and the state and the zip code and all that kind of stuff. So if I had like a extra thing on the end of it, apartment 4B, something like that. So my street address, 515 North Main Street, APT 5B, all of that probably wouldn't add up to more than 25. Um, city, why don't we say 20? And I'll slow this down in a second. State, province, if I'm assuming that none of my customers are going to be from Canada, and it could just be a state, then why not set that one for just two characters? Zip Postal will do a special thing with that. And we don't... Oh, Country Region. I think I don't really even need that field. So let's try this. Let's uh, click. I'm, I'm moving my mouse into the top edge where it says Country Region, and I'm clicking to choose that column. And then I'm literally going to tap the Delete key to take it right out of there. It says, are you sure you want to permanently delete this record and all data that's entered? Right now we don't have any data in it, so I can get away with, yeah, go ahead and do that. Also, if I'm not going to have any Canadian customers, I could just call this one State instead of State Province. So I'm going to right-click on that, and I'm going to rename it as just State. All right, now that's a lot, and I did those kind of fast. 
So I'm going to go back and, uh, you know, do it a little bit slower. I can see that I mistakenly entered 20 as data in the city column rather than the uh, field width. So, um, so I'm tapping the delete key to get rid of that. And I'm clicking in uh, to put my cursor there. And I'm going to set my field size for the city to, I think I said 20. So I'm tapping 20, hitting the enter key. It says some data may be lost if you've got longer city names in there already. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, I don't have any data in there yet to worry about. So I'll say, yeah, let's do that. 20 is still showing up in a funny place there. All right, we'll deal with that in a minute. So just going across here, last name we set for 25, first name 15, address 25, city 20, state only 2, postal code, we haven't made a choice there yet, so it still says 255. So if I switch to the design view, you'd be able to see those numbers easier. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to switch to the design view. Ah, you still can't see them any easier. You have to click on each one to see the lengths. So put the video on pause, catch up with me there. Then you might need to write these down because it's kind of hard to go back and forth between them unless you pause in between. So last name 25, first name 15, address 25, city 20, state 2, postal code we haven't filled in yet. Put the video on pause, catch up with me that far, please. All right, now um, I'm wondering, do any of these need to be something other than short text? Name, address, city, state. Looks like they're all going to be text fields. Now the postal code, it's going to look like numbers, but I'm never going to be doing math with it. And if I tell it that the postal code is a numeric field, it turns out there are some zip codes that start with a zero. There are actually some zip codes that start with two zeros. And if I tell it that that's a numeric field, then when I fill in the zip code, if it starts with a zero, it'll drop that leading zero, and I'll wind up with a four-digit zip code. So, you know, we'll probably want to do something about that. Uh, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it as we go. But short text is, uh, is basically what we want to start with there. All right, now I'm noticing that the owner ID is, again, an auto-numbered field. And that's what happens anytime you let Microsoft Access make the primary key for you. Now there's a term that I've only used once. Let me remind you that primary key is a field where no two records in that table can have the same value in the primary key field. And that makes auto numbered kind of a cool way to do it because it automatically numbers the next record. Um, there are a couple of things about auto numbered fields that some people don't like, but I also don't want you to think that every single time you put in a primary key that it has to be auto numbered. So let's talk about how we might change that up. So right here where it says auto number, I'm clicking to get my list arrow. I'm going to tell it I want to make it short text instead. So do that with me, please. Change the owner ID. It's still going to be the primary key. I just don't want it to be auto numbered. I would like to change it to short text. So pause our video and do that with me. All right, it's time to put in some descriptions over here. So last name, first name, you know, that part's probably fairly obvious, but I usually put in some kind of description anyway. Enter last name. Enter first name. Overkill is better than underkill. Address is going to be street address and apartment number, if needed, we can say. The city. Enter city name. State. Enter two character abbreviation. Enter city name. Didn't move down. There we go. Uh, for the state, enter two letter abbreviation. By the way, there's a comedian named Stephen Wright, and one of my favorite lines of his is. Don't you think the word abbreviation is too long? I agree with him there. All right, zip and postal code. Let's talk about a special thing here. Um, it's called an input mask. Now, you have seen input masks on various screens. You just never knew they were called input masks. So um, you're going to watch me first, and then you're going to try it with me. So I'm clicking right here in the property for input mask. And when I click there, I get three little dots over here at the right-hand side. 
And then down here in the bottom right corner, it says this would be a pattern for all data to be entered into this field for the uh, zip or postal code so far. So I'm going to click on the three dots. Opens up a little dialog window. Says you got to save the table first. I'll say yes. And then here comes my dialog window with special kind of input masks, meaning it will automatically fill in, for example, for a phone number, it will automatically fill in parentheses around the area code, a little space, and then a hyphen between the uh, last three and last four digits there. Social security numbers, it would group them into three digits, add hyphens for me automatically. Zip code. So right now we're talking about zip postal, so I'm going to go with zip code. And then down here I see it says try it. So I'm going to hit the tab key to jump into the try it box, and my zip code could be 65645. And you notice it's still got four more characters in case I know the last four digits of that. And if I know them, I can fill them in. But if I don't know them, I can actually leave those last four blank as it happens. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why. So I'm filling in the first five there, and I'm clicking Next. And then it says, do you want to change the input mask? And it's got a bunch of zeros and nines here. And all I want to tell you about that is zeros mean they are demanded, and the nines mean that they're optional. So I could enter the five digits, and I could skip over the last four digits if I don't know them. But if I go down here and try it, and I only fill in the first four digits, and I try to click on, hello, let me click down there. Excuse me, let me hit tab key to jump down there. If I only fill in the first four numbers and I try to move on, it says, no, you can't do that. For the input mask with this coding, you have to fill in five characters. Now, they don't really spell that out, so it would be kind of nice if they would say that in English, but I'm just telling you, because of the layout here that said uh, five zeros, you can't get away with just the first four characters. You have to fill in at least five of them. And then if I start filling in the last four and I don't finish the last four, it actually has no complaint about that. Now I could also change my placeholder character. Maybe instead of underscores, maybe I'd like to see pound signs. And if I hit the tab key to try it out now, then you can see I see pound signs instead. Hashtags, if you want to call them that. So let me back up a little bit because I would like you to try this now. And again, it's complaining that I didn't fill in at least five characters there. So there we go. So I'm going to back up here, and I would like you to join me now. So again, the way that I got there, let me just cancel for the moment. So the way I got there was I was in the zip postal code field, and in the properties down here, I clicked input mask, clicked the three dots. Yes, save the table. And let's go with the uh, zip code input mask. We'll click next. It'll set it up like this. You don't really have to play with the placeholder if you don't want to. We'll click Next. And then I've, it's got one last question here. How do you want to store the data? Do you want to store it with the extra symbols in there? Or do you want it to just store the numbers? And early on in my database life, I used to say, hey, just store the numbers. But then I realized later when I tried to copy it into Excel, um, in Access for, like a, for a phone number, I could see the parentheses around the area code. And then when I copied it into Excel later, it didn't bring in the parentheses because I hadn't stored them. So nowadays, I usually say, yeah, store it with uh, whatever symbols are part of the input mask. Store them with that. I'm going to click Next. And it says, you are all done. And I'll click Finish. So catch up with me there. Make that an input mask for a zip code. And just run it through its paces there. And you should wind up with this property at the end. All right, welcome back. Now I'm starting to talk about how many characters do I need in there. So it's five digits, plus store the hyphen, plus the four more digits. Sounds like 10 to me. So instead of using 255 characters to store that 10-digit uh, zip code, we're going to make that 10 for the field size. All right, we have just set up our owner's table. So we've set our field size to be 10 to match up with the, um, with the input mass that we've got created. And we don't really need to necessarily drop any information for our data entry operator, other than maybe enter just the numbers. Access will add hyphen. 
and then I'm going to hit the enter key to finish typing that in. So let's end this session right here, and in the next session we're going to come in and actually fill in data. But there's one more thing I would like to write, a little note to my data entry operator, that my owner ID needs to be first three letters of owner's last name, followed by, or maybe just then, three digits of street address. And if that's going to be the case, three letters of the owner's last name and then three digits of the street address, then my field size could be six characters instead of 255. So put the video on pause, take a moment and do that. Um, and then we're going to take a little break, and then we'll come back and we'll do our first data entry into this new table. So here we go. Um, I'm going to end this session right here. Hopefully you've caught up with me with all the stuff that we've been doing so far. Having created our second table, it's time to now fill in information about the first of our owners. So I see a little note down here about what I'm supposed to put in the owner ID field involving three letters of their last name and three digits of the street address. And maybe I don't know what that is yet. So I'm going to go start filling in last name. So last name is McAllister. First name. Now, my real name is Daniel, but I sometimes go by a pseudonym that I've made up for myself, Fernando. Street address, 123 Elm, city of Bakersfield. State of CA, and if I try to put in any more than that, it won't let me, because it's only allowing two characters. Um, one thing that I want to come back to in a minute, if I enter lowercase letters, so far they look like lowercase letters, there is actually a property that I can change about that. And then the zip postal code, uh, 94333. Okay, so now I'm going to say I am done with that record. I'm going to hit the down arrow key to go to the next record. And I get an error message. It says, you must enter a value in the owner ID field. And so why is that? Well, this is why. There's a couple of things you need to know about the primary key. Um, I mentioned that the primary key is there so that I have no two records with the same value in that particular field. Second thing that I've mentioned in passing is that a table is automatically sorted by the primary key. And then here's a third thing that we haven't talked about yet. If your table has a primary key, it cannot be left blank when you're doing data entry. So that's what it's complaining about right now. And I kind of did this on purpose to demonstrate this idea here. So it's time for me to click on OK and go back here and make sure I actually do enter the owner ID. It's supposed to be, all right, owner ID, I'm clicking in there. It's supposed to be the first three letters of the owner's last name. Let's see, that would be MCA followed by three digits of the street address. So what if the street address is like 10ELM? Then maybe I would have to put in a leading zero, like 010 for the last three characters. In my case, it's 123, 123 Elm Street. Seems like there was a Freddy Krueger movie or something like that, one of those slasher movies. Now I'm feeling really old as I remember a nightmare on Elm Street. Anyway, when I hit the down arrow key to move to another record, this time it has no complaints because I did actually fill in that primary key. All right, so put the video on pause and catch up with me. You don't actually have to fail to enter the owner ID if you don't want to. You can just fill it in right now. But I did want you to see that uh, if it doesn't, if you don't fill in any information in the primary key, you should get an error message. So take a moment, put the video on pause, and enter that data for Fernando McAllister. All right, welcome back. So, Fernando, let me explain Fernando for a minute. Just give you a little brain break here. So, occasionally I will eat at Boston Market. And Boston Market is one of those places where they take your order and then they call your name when it's up. And for some reason, every time they say order up for Dan, three of us come walking up. So, I was trying to think of what to do about that. And I saw somebody else do something that gave me an idea. So, this guy was probably college-aged. And he's at the counter, and the lady behind the counter is saying, so we'll call you when your order is up. What would you like us to call you? And that may have been the wrong question to ask this young man, because I'll never forget his answer. He said, oh, really? 
Would you call me Fuzzy Face Shark Boy? See how long I've remembered that. Um, but she went with it. So she was typing that in. Her tongue was sticking out of her mouth, out of the side of her mouth while she's typing. And then five minutes later, when his order is up, you hear, Order out for a Fuzzy Face Shark Boy. And everybody turns to look. But only one person came up. So I don't go so far as Fuzzy Face Shark Boy. But when she tells me that she'll call my name when I up, I tell her my name is Fernando. And so far that's been working. Three of us don't come walking up. Actually, I don't say Fernando. I say Fernando. A little bit of a sexy twist on it. Anyway, more information than you needed to know. And then I was trying to think one day, where did Fernando the name come from? And I think it was from Billy Crystal on Saturday Night Live doing his impersonation of Fernando Lamas. You feel as good as you look, and you look marvelous. I think that's where Fernando came from in my brain. Anyway, um, not at all related to access, but a little bit of a brain break there in the middle of things. Trying to have a little bit of fun in what can be a rather dry, geeky subject. So that's where Fernando came from. So um, anyway, feel free to fill in a name, and it can be different than that one if you like. And then I'd also like to talk about how can I get these characters to look like capital letters, even if I didn't type them that way. So I'm going to take just one minute and talk about that. So pause the video, fill in some uh, information there, and then let me go tell you about how to make the CA look like capital letters. So here we go. To get the CA to look like capital letters, I'm going to go to the design view. And in the properties for the state, I did set the field size to be two characters, and then there's a property right under there that says format. And here's kind of a weird one. If I put a greater than sign right there, then no matter what I type, uppercase, lowercase, it will dis be displayed as uppercase letters. It will actually be stored in the database however I typed it. For example, in this case, I typed it in lowercase letters. That's how it'll be stored. But when it's displayed on screen in just a you know, little printout of the data of the table, it will look like capital letters. Um, now, any theories on if I put in a less than sign instead of a greater than sign? Yes, it would actually make them look like lowercase. And usually the next question people ask me is, is there some way to do title case? The answer is no. There's not a format for that. Okay, so we've uh, let's go check it out. I put in my greater than sign. I'm switching to my data sheet view. It says, do you want to save the changes to the structure? Yes, I do. And now as I look at the state, it says California. It looks like capital letters. If I click in there, I can see that it's actually being stored as lowercase but the greater than sign for the formatting makes it be displayed as uppercase letters. So what did we see out of all of that? Well, let's see. We've seen a new property that can make things look like uppercase letters. We've seen that a primary key field doesn't have to be auto-numbered, that it can be combinations of other things. Now, in this case, this little method that I've used, three letters from the name, three numbers from the street address, when I get up around, you know, 500 um, uh, records in there, 1,000 records, I may run into, by coincidence, two different people who have the first three characters of their last name and first three uh, numbers of their street address, but it probably won't happen very often. And if it really becomes a problem, then I can change what the rules are about that. But mostly what we've seen there is it doesn't have to be an auto-numbered field. Now, why would I ever not use auto-numbered fields? Well, let me just mention one thing that messes people that, you know, causes some people to not like auto-numbered fields. If I go over here to my pets table and I start putting in a new pet name, like uh, Bill, the, the uh, puppy dog, um, you can see that it's entering a 2 here for the next record. Okay, well, that part's cool, but what if I realize, oh, I don't have the information about Bill yet. I need to not enter this data. Anybody remember what key I can hit right now to stop entering this data and take back what I've done already? Hopefully the word escape has just leaped to your tongue. I'm going to tap the escape key. Sure enough, since I hadn't like moved on to the next record, I don't have to worry about undo. But watch what happens when I start putting in the next name. It's a number three now. There will not be a number two. Even though I never finished record number two, it has thrown number two out. It has retired that jersey, shall we say. And if I have filled in a record, and then I, later I delete that record, and it was pet ID number five. What's pet ID number six is not going to like crawl up the list and become number five or anything like that. 
So that's a couple of things that are, you know, just special about auto-numbered fields that bugs some people. But basically what I'm saying here is you can have primary keys that are not auto-numbered fields. All right, I'm going to tap the escape key again a couple of times to stop entering that record. Well, in module one, we opened up an existing database, one that we had downloaded called Northwind, and we saw that it had lots of tables and lots of queries. We saw that each of our tables has the user side where we do data entry called the data sheet view, and it also has the design view where somebody has to decide what kind of fields are we going to keep track of. And so we went in and set up our tables for the uh, veterinarian's office in two different ways. The first one, we built it entirely in the design view. The second one, we built most of it in the data sheet view, where we could have been doing data entry, and we eventually came back there and did do the data entry. And uh, that allowed us to see those quick starts, where it could put in the first name and last name fields for us, and the uh, address, city, state, zip, country fields, through one of those quick start setups. Then we started doing data entry. We saw that for an auto-numbered field, um, you are not allowed to type in there. But for an auto-numbered field, if you begin entering a record and then quit entering that record, that number will have been used up. And I mean, that's not an awful thing, but you know, just one of the side effects of having an auto-numbered field. We were also able to make the owner's table, where we made it have a primary key but not an auto-numbered field, and uh, we were allowed to do whatever we wanted in there. A couple of things that we've seen about primary keys. First of all, I haven't really mentioned this, but a table doesn't have to have a primary key, but it's strongly recommended, and in our next uh, module, when we start creating relationships between tables, the primary keys will become even more important. So if you have a primary key in a table, it is a unique identifier. No two records can have the same value in the primary key field in that table. And it's the automatic sort order for a table is by the uh, primary key. And for data entry people, you're not allowed to leave the primary key field blank. So that's a little wrap-up of what we've seen in Module 1. As we move into Module 2, we're going to start talking about what makes a database a relational database. And part of what that will involve is, how about later when I need to do some kind of report about a particular pet and the owner of that pet, so this idea of having information in multiple tables means that eventually I need to be able to pull information from more than one table at a time. And in order to be able to do that, I'll have to figure out some way to create relationships between the tables. And that will be the big discussion of Module 2. So come on back for Module 2. So far for Module 1, the creation of the tables and what the heck is a database. This is uh, Dan, also known as Fernando McAllister, signing off. Good day, one and all, and welcome to Microsoft Access 2016, Module 2. As you can see, my name is Dan McAllister, and I will be your instructor today. Our modules usually start out with practice files, and that will be true here for Module 2 as well. So you will need to go grab your practice files. Depending on how those practice files come to you, um, you may see one folder named Practice Files. You may see another folder named Homework Files. We're going to be using the practice files. And they usually come in a zipped folder. So you'll need to download that zipped folder and then never ever try to work on files inside a zipped folder. You would need to extract the files from that zipped folder. I'm going to be putting mine in a folder named Access 2016 Practice Files. And I'm going to put that folder out on my desktop. You can choose to put them wherever you like, but that's where I'm going to put mine. And if you want yours to work just like mine, then do yours that way. So go grab your practice files and then come on back for the beginning of our next lesson. All right, let's get started, assuming you have your practice files extracted from the zipped folder. So I would like you to start Microsoft Access 2016. Put our video on pause and take just a moment and start that up. When you do, this should be the start screen that you see. You may or may not see over here at the left-hand side the Veterinarian Database and the Northwind Database. Those were used in Module 1. So if you played along in Module 1, you should see those over at the left side. If you didn't, then don't worry that you don't see those over at the left-hand side. What we're going to do is we're going to click on Open Other Files. So take a moment and start Access, and then we will click on Open Other Files. All right, welcome back, everybody. So let's go ahead and click on Open Other Files. 
and then we're going to navigate to wherever you extracted your zipped folder. So I'm going to click on Browse, and when I do that, like all good Microsoft and Adobe programs, first place it looks is the Documents folder. But that's not where I extracted my files to. I put mine out on the desktop. So I can scroll up here on the left-hand side and click to go to my desktop. And then over at the right-hand side, I can see my Access 2016 sample folders. I'm going to double-click on that. And then we're talking about Module 2, so the next place, double-click on Access Mods 1 and 2. And I'd like to start with the very first one on the list here, alphabetically, Beyond Clean First Draft. Now you may or may not see the file name extension out here, the ACCDB or the MDBs as they might be. Um, don't worry if you don't see those, they're not terribly important. And that's not actually controlled through Access, that's controlled through Windows. So let us open the one named Beyond Clean First Draft. I'm going to double click on that right here. And here's how it opens up for me. And because it came from a website initially, it has this security warning, says so certain content has been disabled. Macros, for example, are being disabled. And for most of our lessons, we're going to come up here and choose Enable Content. By the way, thinking in the future, when we get to Module 8, when we open our first file in Module 8, we will not choose Enable Content, but obviously that's on down the road. So I'm going to click on Enable Content, and then here's what my screen looks like once I have done that. So please take a moment, put the video on pause, go open that file named Beyond Clean First Draft, please. Now over here in my navigation pane, I see the title Tables, and there seems to be one named Work Order. Now, something that we talked about in Module 1, but we know that not everybody does our modules in order, was this lookup list right here, this little pull-down list. When I click on that, I have two groups of choices here, how to navigate and how to filter. So right now I'm navigating by object type, and I'm filtering for only the tables. Now if I want to see tables and queries and forms and so forth, I can say show me all the access objects. But in this case, when I do that, it turns out all I have is this one table anyway. So let's take a peek at it. Let's double click on the work order table. And it opens in what's called the data sheet view at the right side of my screen. So please pause our video and double click to open the work order table, please. So the general idea of this database is that I run a custodial company. So I hire janitors, I provide them with the training, I provide them with the supplies, and then I farm them out. I hire them out to other companies. So for example, I've got a client named Adder Cleaners, and I've got information about that company. I've got another company named The Art Shop. I've got another one named Beecher, as you can see here. And I've got information, I've got contact information there. Street address, city, state, zip code, their balance. Boy, that's a pretty important one. And then as I begin scrolling to the right, I can also see the name of this custodian that I've assigned to them and the custodian's address, and the custodian's city, and state, and zip code, and their hourly pay. Well, the problem with the way this is set up is not so much that there's a lot of fields, but it's that there are two ideas in one table here. I've got information about the clients, and then over here towards the right-hand side, I've got information about the custodian assigned to the client. And that means that every time I assign a custodian to a different client, the way this is set up right now, I'm retyping their name. I'm retyping the address and the city and the state and the zip code for all of my custodians. Now, the more times I have to type that, the more storage space I'm using in my database, wherever I'm storing it. And the more times I have to type it, the more the chances are of, shall we call it, pilot error. Um, for example, there are already several things that are wrong with the data entry, and this table only has three records in it. Take a look at it, and in here you should be able to find a couple of mistakes that are already happening. Yes, for example, I see Michelle Lee with one L and Michelle with two L's. We've got a Dunlop Street over here. We've got Liberty Estates. Oops, then we got Libert Estates. So the more times I have to type that, the more chances there are for pilot error. I've got two different custodial pay rates over here. Later on, when I go to print out a list of my custodians, Access won't know that Michelle with one L is the same as Michelle with two Ls. So really what should be broken down here is one table for the custodians and one table for the clients, and then some way to tie them together. 
this creates what's called a relational database. Um, so we'll be talking about how could we separate out these two tables, and then, more importantly, how can we make a relationship between those two tables. So now that you can see what the problem is here, let's see our first step towards a better solution. So in the next section, we're going to open up another file named Beyond Clean without the words First Draft. So having seen, so having seen that the more times we have to type something, the worse off we are for a couple of reasons, using more storage space and chances of making mistakes, let's go see the first version of an improvement to this. When you have one file open in Access and you tell it to open another one, it will automatically close the first one. So we're going to go up to the File tab. We're going to tell it to open a file. We're going to head to our folder where we extracted our downloaded files. This time I'd like to open one named Beyond Clean that doesn't have the words First Draft in its title. So I'm about to double click on that, Beyond Clean, in my Mods 1 and 2 folder. Um, you'll notice this time it has two tables. You are going to see the thing about certain content being disabled. You'll need to click on Enable Content. So pause the video and go open the file named Beyond Clean. All right, welcome back. Uh, so one of the first things you're going to see here is that this time there are indeed two tables, one for my clients and one for my custodians. So let's open the client table. I'm going to double click on that. Why don't you do the same thing? So pause the video and open your client table, please. All right, so here you'll see that I've apparently managed to get myself some more clients. And as I scroll to the right, I see contact information for the clients, but I don't see the information about the custodians. I do see one column here labeled custodian ID. And I do have the same custodian ID in more than one record here. So let me throw a term at you that we talked about in Module 1. If you didn't do Module 1, maybe you've heard of this term before. Anyway, a primary key. So tables don't have to have primary keys, but they're strongly suggested, and they're going to come in handy for some of the things that we're going to do in this module. So I'm wondering, is it possible that this field could be a primary key in this table? So those of you who know about primary keys, one glance at this would tell you, no, this cannot be the primary key. Because a primary key field is used as a unique identifier. That is, no two records can have the same value in this table in that one field called the primary key. And you can see right now, I have custodian ID number two has been assigned to one, two, three different of my clients. So this cannot possibly be the primary key of this table. However, if I scroll to the left, I'm noticing that each client number is different. So I have a suspicion that that's my primary key. And in fact, database programmers are usually nice to each other, and they'll make the primary key be the first column. But you can't guarantee that. So right now, it's kind of hard to tell for sure if this is the primary key. But those of you who were here in Module 1, or those of you who are kind of experienced in Microsoft Access, you would know that if you switch over to the design view, you would be able to see these field names, and one of them might be marked as the primary key, or at least you'd be able to tell that there wasn't a primary key. So here's where I can go to my design view. Under my Home tab, in my Home ribbon, I'm going to click on the little Draftsman's Tools in the View button, and here I am in the design view of my table. And if I look closely, I can see that there is a little key symbol right here for my client number, and that means it is the primary key, and it says so right over here. So yes, that is the primary key of this table. I'm going to now click on the Data Sheet View button and go back to the Data Entry side. So if you'd like to try that on your screen, just pause the video, go to the Design View side, and prove to yourself that that actually does have a primary key. I would like to take just a moment to show you something that has happened in the background when we created our lookup list to uh, join the two tables in a relationship. I'm going to go up to the Database Tools Command tab which produces the Database Tools ribbon, and there's a nice button on here labeled Relationships. And I'm going to click on that, and it opens up a Relationships window that doesn't really seem to have anything in it just yet. And there's a button here labeled Show Table. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to choose these two tables, the client, and then maybe I'll uh, 
well, here's an easy way. I'll click on client and then choose add, and it drops that table back here, and then I'll choose technician, and then I'll click add, and it drops that table in the background, and then when I close this window, I discover here's these two tables with a little join line here, and the join line goes from the technician ID to the technician ID, the foreign key, and the primary key. So I'd like you to do that. I would like you to go to the Database Tools Command tab, and in the Database Tools ribbon, click on the Relationships button to open this window. And at first, you won't see either of these tables. Let me just hide them again here for a second. So at first, you won't see any of these tables. You can then click on, in the Relationships window here, you could click on Show Table, and that would give you a list of the available tables, and you can click on one and click Add, and then you can click on the other one and click Add. There's other ways to do that, but that's as good as any. And then close this window, either with this Close button or that Close button, and you should see the relationship line, sometimes called a join line, between those two fields, the foreign key in the client table joined to the primary key in the technician table. So put the video on pause and do what you just saw me do. All right, we're going to build on that in our next session. Also, I'd like you to try this. I'm going to point at that join line, and I'm going to double-click on it. Tap, tap. Opens up this window that says the technician table has the technician ID field, and the client table has the technician ID field. And this is creating a what's called a one-to-many relationship. That is, in the technician table, there is only one technician with um, technician ID 002, for example. But in the client table, there are many clients that are assigned to technician ID 002. So a one-to-many relationship. The one primary key hooked up to the many records with the foreign key that have the same technician ID. All right, and again, that's leading to something that we're going to talk about more in this next session. So if you would like, put your video on pause, go to that uh, database tools ribbon, go to that relationships window to open up this thing, we added those two tables, the client and the technician, and you should be able to see the join line. Now the new thing was double-click on the join line to see this information about the fact that this is a one-to-many relationship. Pause that video and check those things out. All right, welcome back. So we can see the uh, relationship line between those two tables that was created through our lookup list. In the next session, we're going to see another way to use this relationships window to create relationships between tables, but we will be doing it with a new database. For this next session, I would like to use a new database that we haven't seen before. So we'll go to File. We will choose uh, Open a File. We're going to browse out to our Mods 1 and 2 folder. And this time I'd like to open one named Query, please. Query. Now mine is asking me if I want to save changes to the design of the client table. That was with the lookup list and so forth. I'm going to say, yes, please, do save those changes. Do I want to save the changes to the layout of the relationships window? Yeah, I would like to do that as well. You're probably going to see these same two questions. So put the video on pause and join me in going to the file menu and choosing to open the database named Query. And then if you get questions about do you want to save the, uh, the layouts of things, choose yes and yes. And then in this window, of course, we will choose Enable Content. And this is how your screen should look once you open the database named Query. So pause the video and do those things. Catch up with me here. Welcome back. Now right away, there's a couple of new things happening over here in the navigation panel. Let me use my third-party zooming in software to zoom in on that navigation panel. Notice the funny names of the tables here. Names of tables starting with TBL and then having all the words smushed together with no spaces in between. I don't know if I've just created a new word of smushed. Probably not. So, uh, and then my queries. We haven't really played in any queries yet, other than we were exposed to them a little bit in our first module. The names of the queries start with Q-R-Y in this case, and then no spaces in the names of the uh, queries. These are following something called the Lezinski Naming Conventions. L-E-Z-Y-N-S-K-I, if you care. A name for a fellow named Stan Lezinski, who was a bigwig at IBM years and years and years ago. And he did not invent this, but he kind of uh, adapted it from some things that were around already. This naming convention makes things easier for people who know how to program in a uh, language called SQL, Structured Query Language. And things are a little bit easier in Structured Query Language if you don't have spaces 
in the names of things. And in structured query language, it can be handy to know that something is a table compared to a query compared to a form. So we're not introducing this because we think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. We're just introducing these Lazinski naming conventions because you are fairly likely to run into them somewhere in your database life. So we're going to introduce them here. So I have any uh, table name starts with DBL, any query name starts with QRY. We'll see a couple others along the way as we go. But right now in this particular database, that's all we have is tables and queries. Now, um, there's also Lazinski naming conventions for the names of the fields in the tables. So, for example, I want to open up a table named personal data. I'm just going to double click on it. And why don't you do the same thing? So, open up the database named query. You've probably done that already. And then let's double click on the table named TBL personal data. So, pause our video right here and then you catch up with me. All right, welcome back. We are in the uh, TBL personal data. And we can see that we've got some kind of ID, probably a primary key. First field, I don't see any repeating data. First name separated from the last name, got the address, got the city, got the state. And um, so let's go to the design view of this. One of the ways to do it is to point at the index tab for it, right click on it and go to design view there. The other way was available under our home tab. If you go to the home tab, there is the views button. And if you click on the view button, that'll take you right to the design view. So here's my primary key called the STR employee ID. And then there's an STR first name and an STR last name. And there's no spaces in the names of the fields. This is more of that Lazinski naming convention stuff going on. So not only do we have three letter prefixes for the tables versus the queries. As I look here, I have three letter prefixes inside the table for a text field. STR, this is a really old programmer's term, a string variable, STR meaning text. Yeah, you'd have guessed that. No, I doubt it. And then I see one here called DTM higher date, and it says that one is date time, date time, DTM. So these um, naming conventions have been around for a long time. Not every company uses them. I just want to introduce them here because you're likely to run into them somewhere along the way in your database life. Now I'm noticing that I've got a field named STR first name. But when I go out to my data sheet view, it doesn't say STR first name, it says first space name. And yet they are the same thing. Let's see how that can be possible. Let me go back to the design view here. And I'm noticing that for the first name, I'm gonna click anywhere in the row here for the first name. And now I'm looking at the different properties down here at the bottom. So the name of the field is STR first name, that's for structured query language programmers. But down here in the properties, it has a caption of first space name. And you'll notice that when I go to the data sheet view, the caption overrides the field name. So this is how I can have a field named according to the Lazinski naming conventions and yet have them show up here for my data entry operator. Instead of saying STR first name, it says first space name. That's because that's the caption in my design view. So the caption will override the actual field name in you know, certain areas along the way. That's all I'll say about that so far. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is relationships. So let's go ahead and close this table. You could, for example, right click on its name and close it. And if you've made any changes to its structure, it'll say you gotta save this. We didn't make any changes, so it didn't ask us that. And then I'd like to go to that relationships window again. And I'm wondering if you remember which of the tabs it was under. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. You got a one in six chance of remembering which of the command tabs contains the button for the relationships window. It is in fact database tools. So I'm gonna go click on the database tools command tab. And then here is my relationships window. I click on that. And in this case, it immediately opens my show table window without me having to go click on the show table button. And I would like to show all of the tables. Now, one of the ways to do that is to point at a table and double click on its name. Tap, tap. There it is. It's showing up in the background. Another way to do this is to click on one of the names and then hold the shift key and click on another one of the names. Now, that was the control key. I said I was going to use the shift key. Let me do that again. So I clicked on the first one. This time I'm holding the shift key. 
Notice when I use the shift key and click, it chooses all the ones in between. When I clicked on the first one and held the control key, it chooses those two, but not the ones in between. You may have seen that in other programs. So I'm going to click on the first one. I'm going to hold the shift key. I'm going to click on the last one. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to click the add button, and it drops them all in there, and then let's close the show table window. Now you might have noticed that I put in the department table by double clicking on it. And then in the show table window, I still selected the department table and then shift clicked on the last one down here. And then I added those. And that means I actually have the department table in there twice. And if that table shows up twice, the second time it will say TBL department underscore one. There have even been times when I messed this thing up enough that I got the dreaded underscore two, and that means the thing's in there three times. It would be a bad idea to leave it in there more than once. It can create some problems that you don't need. So I kind of did this on purpose, and I hope you did it with me. So put our video on pause. Let's just start that over again. So, um, so feel free to join me there. Remember the way I did it was in the show table window, I double-clicked on TBL department, and that put it in there the first time. And then I kind of made a mistake on purpose. I left the TBL department selected. I shift-clicked on personal data to get all four of them selected. And then I clicked on Add, and this is what I wound up with. I only have four tables over here, but I've got five entries into my um, through the Show Table window into my Relationships window. So put the video on pause, and feel free to join me there making that mistake. All right, so now let's see how to clear out the mistake. I'm noticing the underscore one here. Let's go up and click on the title bar of that, that window, that little uh, table name. Click once on its title bar and then tap the delete key and it will take it right out of that window. So join me there. Um, keep the TBL department, but get rid of TBL department underscore one. You just click on its title bar, tap the delete key, it's gone. It, it hides it, basically, is what's going on there. So put the video on pause, join me. When we come back, we should have these four tables in there one time each. All right. Now, I can take the uh, tables and grab their title bars and move them around and stuff. And I'm noticing for a couple of these tables, I'm not quite seeing all of the field names. So around my company, this thing I'm about to do, sometimes we call it landscaping, like trimming the trees and the, you know, the lawn and stuff. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to touch the bottom of this uh, little dialog list here, and I'm going to get a two-headed arrow and stretch it down until I can see all the field names. And I'd like to do that for this one, but I might not be able to see all, the whole name of the table. So if, in fact, I'm more specific and grab this corner, I can actually make it wide enough to show the name of the table and tall enough to see all the field names. So basically what I want to do is set it up so I can see all the table names and all of the field names without having to scroll up and down. In fact, I need to tell you something. This is the first place I go when somebody just hands me a database that I've never seen before. I go to the database tools ribbon. I click on the relationships window. And if all the tables aren't showing right away, I bring them in through the uh, show tables window uh, and bring them in like this. And very often I will see the relationship lines already. There's one other cool thing that I'm seeing here. Let me use my third party zooming in software here. I'm noticing a little symbol right there. Anybody recognize that? That is the primary key symbol. So when somebody just hands me a database and I come to this window, I can see the names of the tables that are available. I can see the primary keys. What I don't see so far are those little join lines between the tables because we haven't done any lookup lists or anything like that. What I'm about to show you is another way to create relationships between tables here. So let me just back up for a second. I mentioned this in passing in the last session that in order to create a relationship between two tables, two things have to be true. You may need to go the, look those up in your notes. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Put our video on pause. Maybe go check out your notes and see if you can remind yourself of the two things that have to be true to create a relationship between two tables. All right, maybe you're baffled, maybe you found them. The two things that have to be true is, number one, a shared field, one field that's in both tables. Number two, in at least one of those two tables where there's a shared field, that shared field needs to be a primary key. So those are the two things that have to be true to create a relationship between tables. And so far, the only way we've seen to create relationships between tables was through the lookup list. 
starting in the child table where the shared field was a foreign key, and then looking up from the parent table where the shared field was a primary key. And that created join lines. Well, I don't see any join lines here, but we are about to see another way to create relationships right here in this window. So, for example, so I'm looking through these tables. As I look over in my parking table, I see a primary key named STR parking lot code. Just as a reminder, STR means it's a text field. And then I'm looking for some other table that has maybe a foreign key that I could join up with this primary key named STR parking lot code. I'm wondering if anybody sees one. Some of you are probably shouting at me through your monitors right now saying, hey Dan, yeah, TBL human resources data has an STR parking lot code. Now, I need to warn you that they don't have to have the same name in both tables, but they do have to have the same data type. For example, these are both STRs, meaning they are text fields. So that's actually good enough. I have a foreign key here. Notice no primary key symbol. I have a primary key symbol there. I can make a relationship between these shared fields. I have the same field in both tables, and in at least one of the tables, the shared field is the primary key. Woo-woo, I am good to go. So here comes a new way to make a relationship by dragging in this window. Now I'd like you to watch my screen. I'm going to grab the primary key, STR parking lot code, and I'm going to begin dragging it sideways. And at first, it looks like I'm doing something illegal. I'm seeing the Ghostbusters slash there. But I'm going to be brave and just drag over here, and my Ghostbusters slash disappears. And now I'm going to point the tip of my mouse arrow at um, STR parking lot code in, as a foreign key in the human resources data, and I let go. And it opens up this nice little dialog window. So I would like you to try that with me. Let me remind you what I did. We went to database tools, relationships window. We added the tables in here. And now we're grabbing this primary key, STR parking lot code in the parking info table, primary key, and we're dragging it onto the STR parking lot code in the human resources data, foreign key, and when we let go, it opens up this dialog window. So put the video on pause and do that much, please. All right, welcome back. You will notice on the left-hand side, we have the name of the, here I'm going to use this term for the second time today, parent table. Parking info table is the table where the shared field is the primary key. That makes it the parent table in this relationship, and it always puts the parent table on the left. So the shared field called parking lot info in the parent table called TBL parking info is on the left. And then the shared field that we dragged it onto, STR parking lot code, in the human resources data table is on the right-hand side. Primary key on the left, foreign key on the right. Parent table on the left, child table on the right. We'll talk about these checkboxes in a few minutes. Notice this says it's a one-to-many relationship. In the parking lot code, there's only one parking lot code for each parking lot, primary key. In the um, uh, human resources data table, there may be several people who park in the same parking lot. That would be the many end of my one-to-many relationship. And I'm going to finish it off by clicking Create. And now I can see that join line from parking lot code to parking lot code. All right, put our video on pause, and I'd like you to do what I just did. I grabbed the primary key parking lot code, dragged it onto the foreign key parking lot code. It opened up the dialog window, and I basically said Create. There was no OK button. It just said Create. So put the video on pause. Catch up with me. So let's try this again, and notice in my relationship line here, at least one end points at a primary key. All right, I'm seeing another one over here. I'm looking at primary keys in the uh, TBL department. I see one named STR department code, primary key. Now I'm looking in the other tables for a, uh, an appropriate foreign key, STR department. Now they don't have the same name. But I did mention as a little side note, they don't have to have the same name. If you're the one creating the database, be nice to everybody. Give it the same name in both tables. But I'm kind of wondering, this STR department, would that be the same as the code or the department name? I'm wondering. STR department. Well, let's compare them here. So I would like to look at the department table. I can do that easily enough. I'm just going to go point at its name over here and double click on it. TBL department. It has a field named department code, and here it is, two characters. Now back in my relationships window, 
The other table I was talking about in this case was human resources data with its STR department. I'm wondering, is that the two-letter abbreviation or is that the longer department name? So human resources data table, I'm going to double-click on that one, and I'm looking for STR department. ID, hours, pay rate, parking lot code, department code. Wait a minute, wasn't it called STR department? A little bit confusing here. In TBL department, I have a two-letter department code. And in human resources data, I have a two-letter department code. And yet my relationships window said that should be called STR department somehow in my human resources data. How can that be? Well, let's see. Um, it's something we touched on for just a second. I'm going to go into my TBL human resources data, but I'm going to switch to its design view with a right click. So I can see a field named STR department. But as I look down here, department code is the caption. So that's how I can have a field named STR department, and yet the field shows up with the name department code. And as I go to my data sheet view, I can see in both cases it's that little two-letter department code. So these are the same things here, even though they have slightly different names. That's a very long-winded way to say, I want to go to my relationships window, and I would like to join STR department in my human resources data with STR department code in the department table. So that's what we're going to do next. So you can go check that all out if you want, but I think you probably understand what's going on here. What I would like to demonstrate right now is when I drag one field onto another, it doesn't really matter whether I grab the primary key and drag it onto the foreign key, which is what I did last time, or whether I grab the foreign key and drag it onto the primary key, which I did not do last time. So I'd like to prove to you that it doesn't matter which way you drag that when you have a one to many relationship. So watch my screen. I'm going to grab STR department, the foreign key, drag it on to STR department code, the primary key, and when I open it up, it still takes the parent table, where the shared field is the primary key, as TBL department, and puts that on the left as the parent, and then the human resources data, where the shared field was the foreign key, puts that on the right. It doesn't matter whether I drag primary onto foreign or foreign onto primary, it will work it out. It'll put the parent table on the left and the child table on the right. One to many relationship. I click create. Here's my join line, kind of going behind this window. All right, your turn to try that. So feel free to grab the foreign key, STR department in the human resources data, drop it onto the primary key in TBL department. When I double click on the join line, it shows me TBL department, the parent is on the left, human resources data table, the child table is on the right. So go join those two together, everybody. Put your video on pause catch up with me. Come back and we'll link these last two personal data table with the human resources data table because they both have an STR employee ID, but in this case they are both primary keys. Special case here. So come and join me, catch up with me so far. So in the last session we saw that when we were joining a primary key to a foreign key, it really didn't matter which one you grabbed first and dragged onto the other. It always lined up the parent table on the left, the department table where the shared field department code is the primary key, and the child table on the right, the human resources data table in this case, where the STR department is the foreign key. But now we come to a relationship where I have the STR employee ID shared field in the personal data table, and we're going to join that with this shared field over here, STR employee ID in the human resources data table. And this is not going to be a one-to-many relationship. These are both primary keys, which means when I'm done, it's going to create something called a one-to-one -one relationship, meaning for every one record in the personal data table, there is one and only one matching record in the human resources data table, and vice versa. Now, in the end, what that means is either of these tables has the potential, shall we say, of becoming the parent table. So how do we decide, in this case, a one-to-one -one relationship, primary key to primary key, which one will be the parent table? It's whichever one we grab first and drag on to the other one. So whichever one we grab first, that'll be the parent table, and whatever we drag it onto, that will be the child table. And right now we're not experienced to know, well, so what? Well, what does it matter which one is the parent table? Well, under certain circumstances, the parent table has to have a record 
before the child table can have a matching record. And so far that's all I'll say about that, because any more than that I'll have to go into a big long-winded thing, and I'm already doing that. So here's the deal. I want to join the personal data table to the human resources data table, and in my case I would like to start with the personal data table becoming the parent and the human resources data table becoming the child. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to grab the um, primary key in the personal data table first. I'm dragging that one onto the primary key of the human resources data table. And when I let go, notice it takes the one that I grabbed first, personal data table, puts that on the left as the parent. And the one I dragged it onto, even though it was also a primary key, that human resources data table has become the child on the right. So please do that the same way I did it. And notice down here it doesn't say it's a one-to-many relationship. It says this is a one-to-one -one relationship. So do what you just saw me do. I'm going to click Create to finish creating that, and then here's my join line. So please do what I did. Grab the employee ID from the personal data table, making it the parent, and drag it onto the employee ID of the human resources data table, making it the child. And so that's the end of our discussion about using the dragging fields method to create a relationship between tables. Now, over our last few sessions, we've seen two different ways to create relationships between tables. The first one was start in the child table, go to its design view, and do a lookup wizard to join it with the parent table where the shared field is the primary key. Our second way was we went to the Relationships window here. That was under Database Tools and the Relationships button to get into this window. And then we dragged fields between tables. And if it was a one-to-many relationship, it didn't matter which way we dragged it. When it was a one-to-one -one relationship, whichever one we grabbed first, that became the parent table. And what we dragged it onto became the child table. But there is a little bit of a difference in the long run between these two methods. We never did a lookup list in this database. So let me show you the difference now between using the dragging method of creating relationship versus the lookup list method. So first thing I'd like to do is close all of these tabs up here. I'm going to right click on either one. I'm going to choose close all. It may ask me about saving the layout of different windows. If it does, I'll say yes, please. I worked hard at getting those relationships created. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go to that human re resources data table, double-clicking on it. And so I've got the department code here. If I had done a lookup list, I would be able to click here under department code and get a little pull-down arrow where I could assign a new department. That would be most useful when I'm creating a new record down here. But we don't have a lookup list because we never created the lookup list through the lookup wizard. We created all of our relationships by dragging in the relationships window. Now that does mean that I get the little plus signs here for any subtables. So if I'm in the parent table, I get to see the child records from the subtables. But when I'm in the, um, the child table of a relationship, as I am over here, then I don't get the lookup list. So personally, I prefer the lookup list method of creating relationships rather than dragging things in the relationships window. So what if I decided that I would like to make a lookup list for the department code? Well, let's see. I could go to my um, design view of this, uh, of this table. I'm going to right-click on it. I'm going to switch to the design view. And in the design view, the uh, field I'm talking about here is maybe the uh, department field. So I can click over there, and I can say, hey, give me that lookup wizard. But it's going to tell me... Sorry, you can't change the data type or the field size of this field. It's already in one or more relationships. If you want to change the data type of the field, or in this case, if you want to change the uh, lookup part, you'll have to delete its relationship in the relationships window. So in this case, I'm talking about the department field matched up between the human resources data table and the department table itself. Right now, I don't have a lookup list there. I would like to create one. But they said, in order to do that, i got to go to the Relationships window and destroy the relationship between STR Department and the Department uh, field in the uh, Department table. So let's see how to do that. I'm going to go to the uh, Database Tools window. That's where I can get to my Relationships window. 
I'm going to click on the relationships window. And in this case, I am talking about this relationship from TBL department, primary key, parent table here, to the foreign key, STR department, in the human resources data table, child table here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to point at this join line and double click on it. Tap, tap. Here's the relationship. So for the moment, uh, now I'm thinking maybe I can get rid of it by choosing cancel. Not true. Instead, I'm going to right click now on that join line. And you'll notice when I right click, I could edit it. That's this same window. But when I right click, I also get a choice to delete that relationship. So come with me and let's do that. Put your video on pause. Come here to the relationships window. Let's look at the relationship between TBL department and human resources data joined by STR department. And I'd like you to right click on that join line and then click the delete button. It'll check to make sure you really wanted to do that. You will say yes. And that relationship has been broken. So please join me and do that. Put our video on pause. Go to that relationships window. Right click on the relationship between TBL department and human resources data and then choose to delete it. When it says, are you sure? You'll say yes. So catch up with me there. All right, welcome back. Now that that relationship has been broken, I can go to my child table department to code being the foreign key in human resources data and do a lookup wizard from TBL department. So here I go. I want to go into the human resources data table. Ah, it just so happens I have it open here. So I'm going to go to the human resources data table. By the way, if you don't have it open already, you can point at its name over here, right click on it, tell it you want to go to the design view of that human resources data table. So pause the video and join me there, please. All right, time to create our lookup list for STR department in the human resources data table. You may remember to do that, we're going to click on the little pull down arrow over here next to STR department, and we're going to go to our lookup wizard. Now in the lookup wizard, the first choice here says, I want my lookup field to get values from another table or query. That's what we want. We're going to click next. We're in the table name human resources data. We need to look up from the table named, talking about department here, from the table named TBL department. So come join me. Get into that lookup wizard. In the first step, we said we wanted it to get uh, our values from another table or query. In the next step, we have to tell it which table or query. It will be the table named TBL department. And let's click next. All right, hopefully you're catching up with me. I've only got two fields over here. I would like them both to be on my pull-down list. I want to be able to see the two-character department code, and I'd like to see the department name spelled out. Now, I could click on one and then wedge it over and click on one and wedge it over, but in fact, there's the double wedgie here. If I click the double wedgie, it moves both of the fields over to the right-hand side, and I can move on. By the way, if you've ever had a double wedgie, you know how painful those can be. And I'm just going to leave that alone here. I'm going to click Next. We'll let it sort by the primary key. Next. I'm not going to hide the key column. I want to show it. Next. I want to actually store the department code. Choose a field that uniquely identifies the row. That would be my primary key called STR department code. Next. So now I'm looking up here at the top and it says, what label would you like for your lookup field? T STR department. Why don't we make it kind of look like English? We'll just say DEPT, Department. Notice we are out of next now. So we'll change that label from STR Department to just the word Department. And then finally, click Finish. So it says, all right, you got to save the table before the relationship can be created. Do you want to save it now? We will say yes. So apparently we just created a relationship that way. And remember, the advantage to this is we should get the lookup list this time. Instead of just the plus signs in the parent table showing me the, uh, the child table related records, this time when I'm in the child table, which is where I am right now, human resources data table, I should actually get the lookup list this time. So I'm going to switch to the data sheet view. And in my human resources data table, when I'm entering a new record down here, I can click in the department code field and I do get the lookup list. That wasn't there five minutes ago. You may remember when we just had done the dragging to create the relationship, we had plus signs in the department table, but we had no lookup list in the human resources data table. This time we get benefits on both sides. 
We get the little plus signs in the parent table, and we get the lookup list in the child table. So that's my more favored way. I'll call that best practice. So if you'd like to try that, hopefully you've been playing along with me, you deleted the relationship, and then now you're just maybe in the last step of uh, recreating the relationship through the lookup list. Finish that off, and then go down in your human resources data table, the child table, where we have uh, you know multiple RS department codes, so this is the foreign key. If you go down here and start entering a new record, this would be a nice way that you could look up from the parent table and fill in the, um, the department for the child table. So pause that video and catch up with me there, and then we will tackle a new thing together. In this session, I'd like to explore a particular property of our lookup list that we created in the last session. So for example, when I click in the uh, department code field, I see the lookup list. I can choose from the lookup list, and then I can choose another record, or I can click on the pencil, and it finishes saving that. Let's see, I'd like to put that back to what it was before. It's too late to tap the escape key, but I do have my undo choice. You may remember from our earlier module, if you took module one, you get one undo for your data entry. So I just clicked on my one undo and it put it back to what it was before. But here's a little loophole that's set up in this thing. Um, and I don't have a really good reason for why. Let's say that I drag across the choice that's in here and I'm gonna type a choice that is not on the list. There is no XX department. And then when I go click on the pencil, it seems to have no complaint about that. So we have these terms, uh, parent table and child table. The parent table is the table where the shared field um, in the relationship is the primary key. And then we've got the foreign key in the child table. That's the many end of the one-to-many relationship. So the table where the shared field is the primary key, that's the one end of the one-to-many. That's the one called the parent table, and it has parent records in it. And then that other table that you're joining up where the shared field is the foreign key, that's the many end of the one-to-many relationship, and that is the child table in that particular relationship. Um, so to carry that over into the next phase, we have just created, and uh, this is the official name for it, an orphan record. It's a record that has no parent. So I've got an XX department code here, but in my department table, there ain't no XX department. So that was a little loophole here that I would like to close. So first thing I'd like to do is undo it, put it back to whatever it had been, you know, when it was actually one of the choices on the pull-down menu, and I'd like to look at a property of that lookup list. So, um, so now that we've seen the problem, and if you want to try that, go ahead and put the video on pause, and uh, click in one of, the, um, one of the records that already exists, and change it to XX, and then click on the pencil. You'll see so far it has no complaint about that. So pause the video and try that out if you like. All right, so either you have tried that or you haven't tried that. Um, so let's go maybe look at a cure for this. So we're going to go to the design view of this table. And specifically, I am talking about that department field in this case. And I'm noticing down here at the bottom, we've got all these different properties, and we're going to talk about some more of those. But what I'd like to draw your attention to right now is that there is this tab called the lookup tab. So I would like you to click on that with me. Put your video on pause and come click on the lookup tab here in the design view of our human resources data table. Make sure you're in the uh, row about the department and then click the lookup tab. And we're going to talk about a special property down here called limit to list. Right there. And you notice that the default setting for limit to list is no, and that was why I was able to type something that wasn't on the list, and it didn't give me any kind of error message there. Now, I'm not quite sure why that's not automatically set to yes. It seems like that would be a good default setting, but they don't seem to ask me as to what I would like. So all I can do is report the way it is. But we can change that here. We can say limit to list. Um, I notice a little pull-down arrow here, and so I can click the pull-down arrow, and I could choose yes instead of no. Or I could type in a yes. It would not be enough to just type a Y. If you're going to type it, you got to type the whole word. And if you use the little list arrow here, you don't have to worry about typing the whole thing. And then I'm going to hit the Enter key. So I've just changed that property to limit to list is now a yes. So take a moment and do that. Pause our video. Make sure you're talking about the department field up here. Go to the lookup tab in the property sheet, and we'll change the limit to list from no to yes. So do that. 
All right, welcome back. Now we're going to go try it out. We're going to switch back to that data sheet view. Yep, got to save the change to the table. You just change the structure a little bit. So we'll say, yes, I want to save that. So now I'm going to go in here and pick some row and try to change it to XX. A moment ago, it had no problems with that. This time, when I click on the Save the Record button, it says, nope, sorry, the text you entered isn't an item in the list. Select an item from the list or enter text that matches one of the list items. So basically what they're saying there is, I could get away with typing, say, SS, because that is on the list, but gosh, why would I work that hard when I could just use the pull-down arrow and choose SS that way? But it will let me do that if I type a, a choice that is on the list and then click on some other record or click the Save button over here. It allows me to do that. I'm going to undo it to put it back to whatever it had been before. Okay, so you try that out. Hopefully you did that. You went to the uh, lookup tab on the design side of that uh, department code field. You changed the um, property for limit to list from no to yes. And now if you go up here and try to type in something that's not on the list and then tell it to save that record, you should get that same error message that you saw me. I'd like to look at another field here in our human resources data table. It's the parking lot code. Now, you may remember from our relationships window that the uh, parking lot code is joined to the STR parking lot code from the parking uh, info table. Many and the child table here, the one and the parent table over here. But I would like to demonstrate something that's still kind of a loophole in here that can create some problems for you if nobody ever warns you about it. So I'm going to go back to our human resources data table. I want to talk about this parking lot code field. Now this relationship was created by dragging between the two fields in the relationships window. Therefore, when I click in this column, I don't get any lookup list. So let me talk about a thing that can happen that can create some problems for you. So I have this field as a foreign key that refers to a primary key in the uh, parking info table. So I'm going to just double click for a moment in the TBL parking info table, and I see that there are only three parking lots with three parking lot codes, primary key over here, B, L, M, A, and W, I. And then if I go back to my human resources data table, in my parking lot code, I have B, L's and M, A's and W, I's. And I seem to have some people that uh, don't have a parking lot code. Maybe they bike to work, maybe they're new employees and they just haven't been assigned a parking lot code. We'll maybe talk about that more in a little bit. But in the meantime, I'd like to go to the parking info table and I want to demonstrate a little problem that can arise here. Let's say that we're going to change the parking lot code for Blossom Road from BL to BR. So I'm going to do that right here in my uh, parking info table. I'm going to change that from BL to BR. And then I can either click the next record or hit the down arrow key or click the little pencil. And you'll notice it has no complaints about that. I just changed the parking lot code for Blossom Road parking lot from BL to BR. But now if I go back to my human resources data table, I don't have any BRs here. I still got BLs. That's going to create a little problem later when I go to produce some kind of report of everybody who's parked in the parking lot BR. I won't find any because they still say BL over here. So I have just broken the uh, reference link uh, between these two tables. There is something that we could do that would prevent that from happening. I'm hoping everybody sees the problem here. If you'd like to try that out for yourself, feel free to go to that parking info table, change the BL to BR, and then tell it to finish saving that, either by clicking the next record or clicking the little pencil, and you'll discover so far it has no complaints, but in my human resources data table, I now have a whole bunch of orphan records here, BLs that have no parent BL because it's been changed to BR. So there is something called enforcing the referential integrity between these two tables. And so I'd like to show you how to do that. Now that we've seen what the problem is, that I can change the parent record and it doesn't like automatically update the child records or anything like that, that creates orphan records. So let's see what we can do about that. I'm going to go back to my other table, my parking info table. First thing I'm going to do is put this back to BL. Now I do have my one undo here still, so I'm going to go up and click my undo, change that to BL, and now we're going to turn on something called enforced referential integrity. And this is a change to the relationship between the parking info table and the human resources data table. And I'm going to try to make that change here in the relationships window. I say I'm going to try 
sounds like I'm giving you a little tip that maybe something is going to go badly here, and um, and in fact that's the case. But um, you know we'll we'll deal with it as it comes here. So I'm talking about this relationship in my human resources data window with the parking lot code from the parking lot table. So I'm going to go to the relationships window. Here's my human resources data table. Here's my parking info table. There's the relationship line that joins the parking lot codes. I'm going to right click on this join line. I'm going to tell it to edit that relationship. Parking lot code from the parking info table, parent table, child table here, parking lot code, foreign key in the human resources data table. And there's a little checkbox here that says enforce referential integrity. One of these tables referring to the other one. I'm going to check mark that one for my one to many relationship and then I'm going to click OK. And I get an error message here and I'm doing this on purpose because it is definitely going to happen to you. Let me magnify this through my third party magnifying software. The database engine could not lock the table TBL human resources data because it's already in use by another person or process. Now, in real life, it is conceivable that there could be another person working on that because Access is normally a multi-user uh, program. But in this case, it's just me. There's nobody else using this thing. So it's not complaining that another person is, um, is working on this thing. Here's the problem. I wish the error message was a little bit more specific. The problem is that I cannot edit a relationship between two tables if at least one of those two tables is open. I can create the relationship if I have the parking info and or human resources data table open, but I can't change the relationship once it's been created as long as either of those two tables is open. So that's what the problem is here. And I'm doing that to you on purpose. So um, you can either, you know, make that happen, do what you just saw me do, and, you know, see it, uh, see it do that same thing for you, or you can just keep watching. So put the video on pause if you like and try it out yourself. Otherwise, let's keep going. So again, what I just did was turn on the enforced referential integrity, and you should do that much. So we right-clicked on the join line between resource data, parking info. We tried to enforce referential integrity, but we got an error message because at least one of those two tables is open. So here's what we'll have to do, everybody. I'm going to cancel here, or you can click the close button. And then we need to close that table because it's part of the relationship, and that table. So I'm going to right-click to close parking info. I'm going to right click to close human resources data. And now I'm going to try that thing I was trying just a moment ago. I'm right clicking on the join line. I'm going to edit that relationship. I'm going to turn on the enforced referential integrity. I'm going to click OK. And this time it has no complaints. In fact, this time I get a couple of little special symbols. I get a one at the one end of my many, uh, one to many relationship. And I get an infinity symbol at the many end of my one to many uh, relationship. So once you've seen that happen a couple of times, you'll realize that anytime you look in the relationships window and you see that, it means the enforced referential integrity property has been turned on. So go do that, please. Right click on that uh, join line. Well, first of all, you'll need to close the human resources data table. You need to close the parking info table. Then come back here, right click on the relationship line, edit that relationship, turn on the enforced referential integrity. When you click OK, this time you should get no error messages and you should get the two special symbols. Let me remind you of a problem we had in our last session. Before we had turned on the enforced referential integrity, I was able to go to TBL department and change the um, primary key from BL to BR, and it had no complaints, even though I still had a whole bunch of BL people in my child table, human resources data. So now we have attempted to cure that by enforcing the referential integrity. Let's see if we have been successful at that. So I'm going to go back to my uh, parking info table. I'm going to double click to reopen the parking info table. And I'm going to try to change that BL to a BR. Here I am, BL, changing it to BR. Click on the pencil. Uh-oh, I'm getting an error message this time. And as I zoom on on it using my third-party software, it says this record cannot be deleted or changed here in the parking info table because the table human resources data includes related records. So I didn't get that error message last time I changed BL to BR, but now it won't let me do that because I have child records that are BLs in the uh, human resources data table. Well, I'm going to click OK, and then I'm going to tap the escape key, and it puts it back to BL. 
So I'd like you to try that. Pause our video, go to the uh, parking info table, try to change that BL to a BR as we had done, let's say, five minutes ago. And last time it didn't have any complaints, this time it should have a complaint. So pause the video, make it complain like that, and then click OK and let it go back to the BL. All right, so maybe what I'm thinking now is, well, it was complaining about the fact that human resources data has a bunch of BLs. So now I'm thinking maybe I could go to the human resources data table, change the BLs to BRs there, and then I could come back here and change it to BR. Well, it turns out it's not going to work out that way, but let's prove that to ourselves. So I am now going to go over to that uh, child table, the human resources data table, where I have a bunch of BLs over here in my uh, parking info. And so I'm going to try to change this BL to a BR. Maybe that'll satisfy it. So here in the child table, I'm changing the BL to a BR. I'm going to click on the finish saving that record button. Oh, man, I get an error message. And this time it's complaining about the other direction. You cannot add or change a record because a related record would be required in TBL parking info. When I tried to change the parent table from BR to BL, it said, no, no, you got, you got children in the child table. So I'm basically protecting, it's protecting me from myself, if you want to say it that way, to not accidentally create orphan records. So I'm going to click on OK. I understand. It's not going to let me do that. I'm going to tap the escape key to put it back to the BL. And I'm figuring, all right, I'm going to get it. Turns out there is one little loophole here. I can go and just delete one of the pieces of data. And then when I click to save that, it actually has no complaints. So uh, they don't have an official term for that, like an orphan record. I'm going to maybe make up a term. I've just created like a stepchild is waiting for a parent or something like that. So in the uh, no child left behind rule, there is this one break in there. There is this one method that I can do to delete the, um, the um, shared field and maybe I'm waiting to fill it in later. So for our purposes, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to put the uh, BL back in there. I just wanted to demonstrate that that is the one little loophole in our No Child Left Behind rule. I can have blank records where somebody is not assigned a parking lot code, and maybe it's because they don't park there anymore, or they're a new employee and they haven't been assigned one yet, or whatever the case may be. So that's the little loophole in the No Child Left Behind rule created with the enforced referential integrity. Now there are a couple of other checkboxes in that dialog window about enforcing referential integrity. So I'd like to go explore those for just a moment. So we've seen what the um, enforced referential integrity does. Now I'd like to take it one step further. So we'll do that in our next session. Now, I would like to re-explore this relationship here for a moment. I'm going to right-click on it on the relationship line here. I'm going to edit the relationship, and I would like to talk about this checkbox right here. Now, right now it's not turned on, cascade update related fields. By the way, if I turn off the enforced referential integrity, these two checkboxes become unavailable. Can you see how they are suddenly grayed out? So I can't even get to that second checkbox until the first one is turned on. And now I'd like to check mark the second one here that says cascade update related fields. Come do that with me. Hmm. I'm just noticing something. I'm trying to edit this relationship between two tables and they're open. If I click OK, I'm going to get that error message about we can't lock the table. So you know the drill. We're going to have to close these two tables and then come back and we'll edit that relationship. So I'm closing the human resources data table, closing the parking info table. Now I'm going to right click, now I'm going to edit the relationship, now I'm going to cascade the update related fields and I'm going to click OK. So please do that. Close those two tables. They're open in the background here, human resources and parking info. And now come right click on this relationship line, edit it, and turn on the cascade update related fields please. So pause the video, do that much, and then we're going to go see what we have accomplished with all of that. All right, welcome back. So this time we're going to go to the parent table, the parking info table. So let us reopen that, the parking info table. I am double clicking on it over here at the left in my navigation pane. I'm going to go um, and change the uh, parking lot code from BL to BR. Now, the first time we tried this, before we had done any enforced referential integrity, it allowed me to create orphan records. 
with the referential integrity being enforced, now it won't let me create um, orphan records. It wouldn't let me change the BL to BR five minutes ago. Let's see if I can do it now. So I'm changing the BL to a BR here in the parent table. I am clicking to finish saving that. Hmm, it has no complaints this time. So I'm thinking back about the name of that checkbox. It said Cascade Update Related Fields. You may be way ahead of me here as to what just happened. I'm going to go back to the child table here. That was the human resources data table. And I'm going to go look in the parking field. Parking lot code. Ooh, I've got a BR here. I got another BR down here. So changing the BR in the parent got cascaded down into the child. And so everything that used to be a BL is now a BR. So that's a combination of enforced referential integrity and the second checkbox that wasn't available until we turned on the enforced referential integrity that says if you change the parent record, it'll change the child records. I wonder if it'll work the other way. What if I take this BR and try to change it to a BL here in the child table? I'm clicking on the uh, finish saving button. No, I still can't do that because I don't have a related record in the parent table. But if I change the parent record, it changes the child records automatically. I just can't change a child record and have it change the parent record automatically. So I'm going to tap the escape key. So if you'd like to try that, now that you've got the cascade update related fields in there, um, if you haven't already, go to the parking info table, change that parking lot code and have it uh, cascade that over into the uh, parking lot code of the human resources data table. And then if you like, you can try what you just saw me do, try to change the child record and you'll see you still get an error message there. All right, um, so please feel free to put the video on pause and try any of that. All right, welcome back. There was one more checkbox in there, so I want to go back and revisit that. It will be editing the relationship between parking and human resources data. Might as well just close them now. I know I'll have a problem if I don't. So I'm closing those two tables. I'm going to go back one more time and edit this relationship window. And this time there's another checkbox down here. And as I zoom in on it, it says Cascade Delete Related Records. That one sounds a little dangerous. And in fact, it is. The thing that you're thinking it's going to do is in fact exactly what it's going to do. That is, if I delete the parent record, it will go find all the child records in the child table and delete them. There's a little shiver going up my spine right now because there ain't no undo for this. So um, this is a little bit dangerous. And in fact, if what I wanted to do is actually do that, delete some records, there's a better way to do it with, uh, with a special kind of query that we'll talk about a little bit later in another module. So, um, so I'm going to click on OK, having turned on that cascade delete related records. Why don't you go try that with me? Put the video on pause. Let's edit this relationship. Remember, I had to close the two tables. We'll cascade delete related records and OK that. So do that much, and then come on back. All right, here we go. We're going to go see this in action now. So I'm going to go to the parent table in this relationship, the parking info table, the one end of the one-to-many. So I'm going to go back to my parking info table. All right, I'm going to go delete this BR record. Clicking on it. I'm tapping the delete key right now. Says a relationship that specifies cascading deletions is about to cause one record in this table along with related records in a related table to be deleted. Are you sure you want to do this? I refer to this as the last chance for gas before the desert warning because, again, there's no undo for this. But I'm going to go through with it just to demonstrate it. I'm going to say, yep, I wanted to delete those records. So I've deleted the BR out of the parent table. I'm clicking yes. Now I'm going to go to that child table, human resources data. I'm looking for BRs or BLs. I have neither of them. I actually have fewer records in there. I'm down to 18 records. I didn't really tell you how many I was starting with, so it's kind of hard to compare that. But we can definitely see that there are no BRs or BLs in there. We deleted the parent, and therefore it went and deleted the children. So go do that with me. Go see that happen. Just be aware that there's no undo for it. My undo button is grayed out. If I try to do control Z, it silently laughs at me. So go try that out. Remember, you can only edit that relationship if all of the tables involved in it are closed. And I right clicked on it and I turned on the uh, checkbox for cascade update deleted records. 
and then we went and deleted a record in the parent table, and we have seen that it deletes the records in the child table. Our last couple of discussions in this module have to do with some other properties that you can set up when you are in the design view of your tables. So why don't we close all of the windows that we have open right here, all of these little tabs. Quick way to do it, right click on any of the tabs and choose close all. And if it needs to ask me about saving changes to layouts of things, it will ask. So do I want to save the changes to the layout of the relationships window? Yes, please. And apparently that's the only um, uh, design thing that it had any complaints about. So do the way you just saw me do, right click and close all. All right, so let's go to the uh, personal data table. We haven't really looked at it very much here. So I would like to uh, double click on it to open it. And so these are my employees, and I can see that most of them seem to be from either New Jersey or New York. I'm trying to do my Jersey and New York accents there. Um, so I could set it up so that when I'm entering a new record, that they are automatically entered as being from New York, and I only have to type something in there if they are from someplace other than New York. Maybe they could actually be from someplace other than Jersey or New York. So what I want to do is set up a, um, a property of the state field that says the default value is New York unless we specify otherwise. Then I've got another property I want to talk about for the hire date. Now as I look through here, I've got some people who have worked for me for a long time, but I would like to set it up so that when I'm entering a new record for a new employee that I cannot accidentally put in a hire date that's later than today. So these are going to be a couple of things that we're going to uh, control through some properties of this table in the design view. So let's head to the design view of the personal data table, please. A quick way to get there would be to just right click on its name and go right to the design view. I didn't do that because I wanted to show you the data that's in there so far. So I can do that now, I can switch to the design view, or I could right click here on the tab and go to the design view, or the very first way we saw it was to go up here and click on the design view button. So whichever way you want to do it, somehow get to that design view. All right, so here we are in the design view. And the first one I want to talk about is that state field. So I'm gonna click anywhere in the row for the state. I'm noticing we don't have any descriptions in here telling our data entry people what they're supposed to do. I'm not going to make you stop and do that now, but it would be a good idea when you're setting up your own database to fill in that kind of information. Remember how it appears down here in the status bar when they're doing data entry. So for our purposes in my state field, I said I wanted to set it up so that it would say New York for new records, and that way my data entry person could just skip over that and go to the next field as long as the new employee is from New York. Um, I'm seeing the caption down here that says state... You may remember from our earlier discussion in this module, the field name is STR state, and that's spelled that way mostly for structured query language programmers. And yet for my data entry people, I just want the column heading not to say STR state, but just state. Remember how the caption overrides the um, field name. Well, this time I want to talk about default value for the state field, and I'm going to type it in right over here. I'm clicking in the box. I'm noticing over here way at the far right, it's trying to tell me about that, a value that would be automatically entered in this field for new items. Notice it says that. This is not going to retrofit all of my records that are already in there and make everybody suddenly from New York. This is only for brand new records when we're doing data entry. So my default value, I'm going to fill that in as NY for New York. And then I'm going to hit the enter key. And you might notice that it suddenly put quotation marks around that. Now, I could type it with the quote marks, but the good news is I don't have to type them. It'll put them in there for me. So I'd like you to try that. Let's go to the design view of the personal data table. And for the state field, we'll put the default value in there for New York. Put the video on pause and join me there. All right, welcome back. While we're here, let's go take care of that hire date thing. So we're going to go down here to the field name date time hire date. So click anywhere in that row so that we're now looking at properties of DTM hire date field. And I'm seeing a couple of things down here. One of them says validation rule. And the other one says validation text. So a rule is usually some kind of mathematical formula and validation text will be text that appears if they have somehow broken the rule. And then somehow we have to have some way to let them know what the rule is that they may be breaking. 
So this is going to kind of be a three-part thing. So first of all, for the hire date, we're going to give a little note to our data entry people by filling in the description for the hire date field. We're going to say, uh, enter a date no later than today. That doesn't mean they need to do the entry no later than today. It means what they enter needs to have a date that is no later than today. So that tells them what they're supposed to be doing. It doesn't actually enforce that rule. Right now, they could still do it, even though we've told them not to. So now we're going to go down to the property for that field, our hire date, called validation rule. We're going to click to put our cursor right in there. And I see a little dot, dot, dot. These are called ellipses. And as I look at the um, explanation over here, an expression that limits the values that can be entered in the field. And if you want to see more information, you could tap F1 to see um, a little bit of help stuff on validation rules. I'm not necessarily going to tap the F1 right now, but just be aware that that's there to try to find more information about it. So my validation rule is going to say this date has to be um, less than or equal to and then I need the name of a function that would normally put in today's date. Now Microsoft Excel has one called today. Microsoft Access has one called now. So I want to have a validation rule that says the date that I'm about to type in is going to be less than or equal to now. I'm typing in now. And it's trying to give me a little bit of help here. It says this would return a variant of a date type specifying the current date and time. And one of the odd things about this is that it has to have parentheses. And so I had kind of zoomed in on it and then zoomed out on it, and all of a sudden it looks like it says equals now zero. That's not actually true. It now says less than or equal to now open parentheses, close parentheses. That is shift nine and shift zero. And that probably won't happen to you right away. So you'll go with less than or equal to now, and then you probably have to type in the opening and closing parentheses there. And by the way, any of you who have ever used the um, equals today property in Excel, it's the same way, equals today, open parentheses, close parentheses. No arguments inside the parentheses, but the parentheses have to be there. All right, and then I want to have a validation text that will only appear if they didn't do what I told them to do up here, enter a date that was no later than today. So as soon as they click in that field, if they look down at the bottom of their screen in the status bar, they should see this instruction. And then they're entering the date, and then it applies this rule. And if they haven't followed the rule, then we're going to have this validation text pop up in a little message box that's going to say, bad data, please re-enter a date no later than today. Then I'm going to add one more thing that I would never be able to get away with in real life. I told them what they were supposed to do here. They didn't do it, so they're getting this error message. Bad data, please re-enter a date no later than today. And I'm going to add you Dumkoff. So again, I would never be able to get away with that in real life. This is my one chance to insult my uh, data entry operator. Probably not a great idea to insult your data entry operator, but I'm just trying to build in a little teeny bit of fun here into our lesson. So you don't have to insult them if you don't want to, but feel free to put in this validation text. Remember, the validation text will only appear if they have broken the rule that you have turned on here. All right, put the video on pause and do all those things. Put in the message they should see before they type, put in the validation rule, put in the validation text. All right, time to go check these two things out. Remember, we changed two things. We did a thing about the hire date. Then we did a thing about the uh, state being automatically set to New York unless we override it for a new record. All right, here we go. Time to go try it out. I'm going to switch to the data sheet view. It's going to say you've changed the structure of the table. Do you want to save that? We're definitely going to say yes. Data integrity rules have changed. There may be existing data that's already breaking the rule. That is, I may have a higher date that's already later than today. It says uh, it's going to go check that data out. Do I want it to check the existing data to, uh, to test against our new rules? We're going to say yes. It also says this process may take a long time. 
it's not going to take a long time. This is a really small database. So I'm going to click on yes, do your worst, go ahead and test all of that. And it seems to have no complaints about somebody being filled in with a higher date that's later than today. So pause your video and come catch up with me there. All right, so I'm going to scroll down to the place where a new record could be inserted. And notice it already says New York right there. So that's my, um, my automatic setup. My uh, default value for the state field was set for New York. And then I'm going to scroll over here to the date. And when I click in the date part, I get one of those little date picker, little mini calendars. And so here's my today button. And I'm going to make a mistake and try to click on they were hired uh, three days from now. So I click on that and everything seems to be hunky-dory until I tell it that I want to try to save the record. And I'm getting that error message. Bad data. Please re-enter a date no later than today. You doom cough. Right, well, I'm going to click OK. Having walked away stunned and insulted. Then I'm going to try a date that is not later than today, like maybe they were hired yesterday. Or were you born yesterday? Were you hired yesterday? And now when I click on my pencil, it says, oh, you have to enter a value in the employee ID field. What's it complaining about here? You must enter a value in TBL Personal STR Employee ID field. It's complaining that my primary key has not been filled in. My employee ID field. You may remember, any of you who took the module one, if you have a primary key in a table, you cannot leave that primary key field blank. So that's what it's complaining about there. All right, and in this case, I'm not really ready to go forward with it, but we have seen the little thing about having the default value filled in and, um, and uh, entering a new record and uh, having the, um, the error message pop up if we broke the rule. So it said we were supposed to enter a date no later than today, and I tried to do that, and it slapped my hand. All right, in my case now, I'm going to tap the escape key to stop trying to enter that record at all. So feel free to play with that, or you can just say, hey, I saw how that works, and I don't really need to test it out for myself. That's totally up to you. So thanks for hanging out and uh, talking about some of these extra field properties, and also the things about cascading related records and all that kind of stuff in our relationships. So that's module two, everybody, talking about creating relationships. We created relationships through lookup lists. We created relationships by dragging from one field to another in the relationships window. And then we also went into the relationships window and modified some of those relationships. We also saw that you can't modify a relationship between two tables if at least one of those two tables is open. So we saw some of the pitfalls and we saw ways to get around them in our module two, all about creating relationships. When you get a chance, come on back and join us for Module 3, where we'll start talking about using those relationships to create queries. Queries allow you to ask questions of your database, and queries can also allow you to put things together from more than one table, as long as those tables are related. So come on back and tackle Module 3 when you have time to try it out. For the moment, this is Dan McAllister signing off out of Module 2, all about relationships. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing LearnIt.